Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Hey Tommy, good to see you again. Uh, it's been, gosh, about six months since I last saw you at, uh, at CODA, which of course will become, we'll, t- we'll talk something about why you and I would run into each other at CODA given our mutual interest in Formula One. Um, but uh, there might be some people listening to this who aren't familiar with you or your work, though though it's certainly been referenced and you've been on a number of podcasts. So, um, you know, you're, well, why don't you give us a little bit of your background and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Sure. I, I do have a, a varied um, experience and, uh, and background, which I think is, is useful for the bunch of things that, that I do, but also sometimes slightly confusing because people will know me from one arena, but not know the work that I do uh, elsewhere. Um, so I, I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics uh, and neuroscience at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, the majority of my work there is in basic uh, animal preclinical research in brain injury. Uh, We look at ways to treat the injured uh, newborn and pediatric brain, and we also uh, do some work in traumatic brain injury. Um, But sort of before I got to that point, um, I trained as a a medical doctor in the UK. Uh, I worked as a doctor in central London for a couple of years before I did my PhD in physiology and neuroscience. Um, So though I'm not... um, sort of reg- a registered medical doctor currently, I don't have an active medical license. Um, I do have, me- do have medical training and that sort of helps inform a lot of the work that I do. Um, alongside that sort of formal training pathway, I spent a lot of time working with athletes. I was an athlete myself um, as a student. Um, I spent some time coaching uh, athletes, particularly rowers. And uh, that was my main, my main sport. Um, and then later on during my PhD and when I was doing my postdoctoral work, I worked with a company that, that worked with athletes um, trying to improve uh, performance or, or their overall health and their longevity in sport. That was probably the, the main thing that, that we really saw a lot of people wanting to, to focus on. Um, so I have this kind of track along the side where I've, I've worked uh, with athletes in various ways. And then sort of through that got to working with Formula One drivers in particular through a company called Hintzer. I know you've had uh, our good mutual friend Luke Bennett on the on the podcast before. Um, so that's kind of wh- where I do some some additional work is is uh, in athletic performance and health. Um, and in addition to that, I uh, also have some interest in long term cognitive function. So we look at how the brain responds to injury. We look at how to uh, repair that or mitigate uh, injury processes. But what I'm really interested in is how do all these things kind of tie together? So how do aspects around lifestyle and the environment affect how your brain functions throughout your entire lifespan? Um, And so I work with uh, some dementia charities in the UK uh, related to that. And I'm also a founding uh, director of the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. So particularly interested in how we can use lifestyle to improve population health. Thanks, Tommy. That makes a ton of sense, hopefully, for people now to understand the the varied nature of your your both your skill set and your interests. So um let's just let's just start by diving into cognitive decline. And is it and, and I defer to you, Tommy, how you want to do this. Would you like to do this starting with the pathologic cognitive decline vis-a-vis dementia? Or do you prefer to talk about it through the uh the sort of more ubiquitous age-related cognitive decline? So we can start with age-related uh cognitive decline because that's pretty well described. So if you look across large population sets, uh, you'll see that with increasing age, you see a pretty linear decrease in standardized cognitive function. And that's across all the different types of ways that that you can measure cognitive function, aspects of executive function, working memory, um, and except for one type of cognitive function, which is historical memory. Uh, and that's probably because of the way that those memories are encoded. They're sort of moved from the main um, memory uh, storing machinery to, and they're kind of spread throughout the cortex and they're sort of protected from some of the um, changes that happen as we get older. But in general, you just see this steady decrease in cognitive function as people uh, get older. If you then transla- translate that to what we might call some kind of pathological cognitive decline, which would then lead into frank dementia, which is um, sort of uh, a long-term loss of significant uh, cognitive capacity or, you know, cognitive dysfunction. Then uh, 
you might see an accelerated trajectory. So there's some period of what we call mild cognitive imp impairment, which you can uh, diagnose with some standardized cognitive tests. And then eventually that will continue into uh, frank dementia, which there are many subtypes, but the one that probably people are most familiar with and are most concerned about for themselves is Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's dementia. Um, and there are probably multiple things that um, drive both of those paths, but in some individuals there's this accelerated decline that then ends up in, in then having the diagnosis of dementia. Tommy, let's go back to the beginning of that and just make sure that we've given people a real sense of what cognition actually is. You know, one of the most common things I hear from my patients is some sort of complaint around memory. Uh, mm. So just yesterday I was talking to a patient and he was lamenting the fact that, not lamenting the fact, I mean, he, he noted the fact that he had been recently remarried. He was very happy about that but said, you know, one of the unintended consequences of getting remarried is he just inherited like a hundred new people in his life, right? <laughs> because all of the folks who, you know, were his wife's side of the family and her friends and stuff are now kind of a part of his life. And he said, um, I can't remember their names. It's the, mm -hmm. the ability with which I can meet a person, remember their name is decidedly different from when I was 20 years younger. So he's in his late fifties, contrasting this with being in his late thirties. So obviously that's one component of cognition. It, it, by the way, is hands down the one I hear people most complain about. I don't hear many people complain about decreased executive function, decreased mm. processing speed. I, I would suspect it's because maybe most people aren't pushing those to their limits and or we don't have as readily available tools to internally discern um, decreases in that. But, but can you just mm. expand more broadly on overall this both the depths of cognition and, and what it entails, but also this phenomenon that I'm sure the moment someone hears what you do for a living, they're probably <laughs> right up to you at a party giving you the same complaints. Uh, absolutely. And the it's very difficult, actually. You know, so you can um, define you know, these domains of cognitive function. You've essentially already defined them, executive function, which is... Um, usually around complex decision making, but you might, for the average person, it might be, you know, that time when you think about saying something, but then you realize it's a bad idea to say it, right? That's executive function. That's the, your, your prefrontal cortex is jumping in and saying, you know, that's a really bad idea, you know, even if it sort of flashes through your mind. Um, but then you have, you know, various aspects of uh, short term and long term memory. Um, Processing speed, uh, reaction time is, pr is probably um, important as well. Um, however, when you talk to individuals about uh, cognitive function, they obviously they have their own um, things that they want to be good at, right? So it's very personal from an individual. Yes, we can we can put do it, use a standardized battery of tests, and that's what's done uh, clinically. Um, but there's usually some aspect of function that they notice is declining over time or that they want to be better at. And then they can, they can sort of put focused attention into improving that. And I believe that you can improve that pretty much any stage uh, of life. So that's part of it. And you mentioned memory. And of course, this is uh, something that the people will mention the most or will, and will notice in themselves. Uh, but there's actually two different parts to memory and it's, it's different probably in, in most people, even in the setting of sort of standard age-related cognitive decline and in those who have you know, some kind of pathological cognitive decline. The first part of memory is encoding that memory in the first place, right? The information comes in and your brain, you know, signals through acetylcholine and other neurotransmitters to actually say, this is something that we want to recognize and store. And that's the process that seems to be particularly lost in those with pathological cognitive decline. Uh, that's why things like cholinesterase inhibitors were, um, or, you know, and are still used in, in Alzheimer's disease because that helps to bolster some of those encoding uh, processes, but through acetylcholine signaling. And, and this takes place pr predominantly in the hippocampus? Yes. Well, that's where a lot of the process starts. Okay. Um, but over time, you know, you can get you get uh, consolidation and these memories get may get moved around. Like particularly, like we talked about historical memory, they get shifted throughout the neocortex, which is basically the rest of the, the outside uh, of the brain. The, the other aspect is retrieval, right? 
there's information in there and it's getting it out. Um, and retrieval is, you know, retrieval speed is something that seems to slow down with age. Um, but part of it, you know, often we think of this as, as pathological. Part of it may be that over time you just accumulate more information. And the more information that's in your hard drive, the harder it is or the longer it takes to, to bring out a certain piece of information. Yeah, this is sort of the argument that Arthur Brooks used that as we're aging, it's um, you're, as you add memories, you're, you're creating volumes in a library. And yeah. the more volumes in the library, the longer it takes the librarian to go and get the specific reference they're looking for. Um, how, do, how can we figure out the relative contribution of library size versus librarian speed when it comes to, <laughs> uh, you know, accessing these memories, because, um, I guess this is another maybe way to think about that. But the example that resonates for me personally is I either meet somebody and can't remember their name, but five minutes later I can, or I want to, I have an idea. I want to sort of say something about it. And at the last minute I can't remember, but then 10 minutes later, I kind of remember. So, so it's not that it's not there, but boy, it took me a long time to get it. So I think in reality, it's probably very difficult to pass all of these out. Um, and so I don't think we could pretend that, that we know exactly the relative contributions. However, some of this is certainly affected by other factors. And that's something that you can, um, take into discussion with say individual patients or, or individuals who are concerned about their memory. So it seems like um, sleep impairment or some kind of uh, sleep deprivation or you know, suboptimal sleep impairs retrieval. So you know, then that could maybe open up a discussion about sleep. Um, there's some uh, subjective stress seems to also play a role here. So I think some of it is accepting that your library uh, is larger. And some of it is thinking about other factors that may be um, impairing or, or you know, allowing for that process to be suboptimal, such that retrieval um, is harder. Um, and another part that comes into play here, which is, is also important, and it, it falls into that same line of thinking, is that as your library gets bigger, your librarian becomes more selective in terms of the things that they want to actually put on a bookshelf. So imagine as you've met hundreds of people in your life, thousands of people, you add a hundred new people. Um, it's very easy to say, do you know what? The first time I meet this person, I may never see them again. So mm -hmm. maybe it's not actually worth encoding that memory and you become more selective in what actually gets stored. So that may be part of it uh, as well. And these are not necessarily pathological processes. These may be your brain doing its normal job of, well, how do I figure out what's worth storing? And then how do I retrieve what I've decided to store? This may be a question that goes beyond your level of expertise. So I apologize if I'm asking you something outside of the scope, but um, I guess, what is a memory physically? And why is there a finite amount of storage? So if I, if I, I have an understanding of why a hard drive is finite. And if I only have two terabyte terabytes on a hard drive and I keep adding, you know, video to that, eventually at some point there is no more storage capacity. I don't think I have enough of an understanding of what a memory is and why it would therefore have a physical constraint. So there have been, and I will. I uh, absolutely agree with you. This is this is beyond my area of specific expertise. Um, but th I know that this is a topic that is hotly debated, where uh, some people have said that comparing human memory to a hard drive is, you know, it essentially, it's a complete fallacy. It's nothing, it's nothing like that. Um, and so there's, you know, we, we use it because it's something that we can understand. It helps us, you know, sort of apply a very complex uh, process to our own thinking and understanding of how our brains might work. But in reality, that is not how, how memories work. And there shouldn't be a limit on capacity in the same way that there is with a physical hard drive. Um, however, you might still understand that uh, there are uh, probably still a finite number of things that your brain will choose to, um, to encode and store for the, for the same reasons that it, it may, you know, you, you only want to have the information that's, that's probably maximally useful for your survival, for want of a better way uh, to, to, to think about it. And then, you know, that, that puts some, some constraints on, on how the system sets up what it decides to, to store and then retrieve. 
my eight-year-old son last night was asking me these questions. It's amazing when kids ask questions you can't understand, you can't come up with an answer to. And he was asking me where the memories were in his brain mm -hmm. and how they get there. And I'm like, God, these are really good. Like when I was eight, I wasn't thinking of great questions like this. So um, anyway, I, it's disappointing that I can't answer my child's questions. Um, okay, so we've established that that as thing as time goes on, Presumably two things are working against an aging individual. One of them not pathological, one pathological. So the non-pathological is you just have a greater reservoir of memories and your brain might be selectively choosing how to prioritize new encounters and new memories with some understanding that there's, you know, the denominator keeps growing and I have to be selective. But there's also, as you said, or I think as you're implying, <clears throat> there probably are some pathological changes. And whether we use the term pathology or not is probably controversial, but there yeah. are some age-related changes that are occurring that are also, for lack of a better thinking in our analogy, slowing down our librarian, reducing our librarian's vision, <laughs> uh, you know, some, <laughs> some, some way that makes it actually more complicated for us to do these things. What do we think is at the root of that age-related decline that is specific to, be it retrieval, computational cycles, processing speed, executive function, all, all of these things that we would all prize as important pieces, pieces of cognition. So the way that I think about it is that we know with aging, we tend to see a decrease in size or atrophy of the frontal and then the temporal, particularly the medial temporal parts of, of the brain. And the medial, the, the, the medial temporal lobe is where your hippocampus sits, as well as some parts of the cortex around it that support it, like the parahippocampal gyrus and the ent ent entorhinal um, region. And there are multiple schools of thought of why those areas of the brain may be particularly vulnerable. Um, some maybe because of their of their specific function uh, in memory or because they're deeply involved in the initiation and uh, sort of the continuation and structure of sleep, uh, which is obviously very important for memory consolidation and also various uh, processes of recovery and repair. Um, but there's also, um, you, if you think about the whole number of things that your brain is exposed to, um, th those areas of the brain seem to be particularly susceptible to negative outside influences and then also susceptible to you know, beneficial uh, sort of supportive processes like actually putting greater demand on those areas of the brain such that they respond and increase in their function. So when I think about the various buckets of things that are required for a healthy brain, for want of a better phrase, um, they are around uh, supply, vascular supply, supply of uh, metabolic energetic substrate, uh, there are important things around uh, structure and function. So this could be a uh, structure related to um, neuronal membranes. So the importance of, say, uh, DHA, omega-3 fatty acids, and you know, which are concentrated in, in synapses. They're very important for communication between neurons. Um, and then, you know, mitochondrial function uh, as, as, as an important part of that. And then you might think of actually, you know, placing a demand on those uh, on those structures. So in most aspects of biology, the, the function of an, of an organ is proportional to the, the demands placed on it. So that you increase capacity. Um, but then that also requires some period of recovery. And that's where sleep and other things come, in, come into play. Um, plus, you might want to avoid negative outside factors. So if we think about uh, dementia, we know that there's uh, some risk associated with things like smoking, um, uh, potentially uh, air pollution, uh, chronic inflammatory or infectious conditions like uh, periodontal disease seem to be associated with it. So you want to have um, sort of this supply of substrate, you want to have good function, you want to make you allow that area to rest and recover, you want to avoid things that, that then may impact those processes and then sort of what I think is driving a lot of this is the amount that we actually um, you know, ask those regions of the brain to do, which does decline naturally over time, um, based on how we currently structure our our lifespan. Um, 
So of all the things you said there, I think the one that we're, we're kind of going to click on first, I guess, would be this idea of uh, demand and yeah. what we ask of the system. So in in certain areas, as you point out, it's, it's pretty intuitive, right? Um, you cannot maintain muscle mass without putting the muscles under significant demand that is so strenuous that you wouldn't be able to maintain it indefinitely, right? You wouldn't... You know, I, if I look at the workout I did this morning, I wouldn't be able to do that to my muscles or to my heart indefinitely. You can do it for a few hours, but as you point out, if if it, if nothing else through sleep, but even more than that, there are just days when you wouldn't push that hard. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so it, it, in other words, it, it, you sort of think of exercise as a hormetic stress. Yeah. Um, now I haven't thought about it this way, but but there are certain organs for which I. I would guess that that's not true, right? I mean, does the liver need to be stressed? Like, do the hepatocytes need to feel the insult of ethanol to otherwise perform well? I, I guess I haven't thought about it through the lens of kidneys and uh, and and the liver and stuff. What, what do we know about other organs and their need to do what, say, the heart does or skeletal muscle does? So I've I've thought about the liver mm -hmm. um, in particular, and I think you can you can say that the 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 case holds particularly with with uh, alcohol exposure as as a uh, as as the example that's what you said and that's what I think of as well not that um, the liver doesn't function without alcohol exposure but if you if it wants to um, optimally deal with a certain type of um, a product say ethanol it wants to metabolize it then we know that with chronic alcohol exposure before we get to the point where the, the you know, we, we damage the liver. Um, you see an upregulation in cytochrome P450 2E1. You see an upregulation in aldehyde dehydrogenase. You see an upregulation of uh, mitochondrial uh, function and metabolism to regenerate NAD, which is sort of like the rate limiting step for alcohol detoxification. So yes, if you stress the liver with alcohol, it will upregulate its function in order to have a greater capacity when the next, um, you know, the, the next drinking session occurs. So I think there are mm. um, sort of parallels across multiple organ systems. Yeah, and just to make sure listeners aren't hearing this and thinking, oh, he's telling us to drink more, <laughs> to drink more. No, I think what you're saying is, uh, we would all agree that the health benefits of alcohol are none, but you're yes. saying before you get to destroying your liver with alcohol irreversibly vis-a-vis -vis cirrhosis, if your goal is to be able to drink two drinks a day, you have to drink daily. <laughs> Like you, you, you're going to, you're going to have a better job tolerating two drinks if you occasionally have a drink, as opposed to if you never have a drink. I mean, that's sort of what you're basically saying. Yeah, that, that's right. And so if you want your, your, if you want an organ system to function in a specific way, so you want your brain to function, uh, improve its function in a, in a, a spe specific domain, or you want your body to fun you know, your skeletal muscle or your cardiovascular system to function better in a specific domain. You want to train for a marathon or you want to be a competitive powerlifter, right? You apply um, a relevant stressor that's, like you said, it's hormetic and you give time to recover and adapt to it. And then you get an increased capacity later. And so I think that that's very relevant for the brain, uh, but I might use um, exercise as, as a way for people to better understand it because you can kind of see that happening. But then to kind of draw that analogy out, um, you might say, okay, there are other 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 organ, other organ systems where there's evidence that that's that's the case as well. So let's go back to the brain and talk about what might be a difference between kind of a positive versus a negative demand. So um, I'm sure most people listening to this podcast right now are under some cognitive demand. We're, you know, we're we're not just sitting here idly shooting the breeze. We're we're talking about stuff that, for for most of us, requires some thought, some concentration to pay mm -hmm. attention to this. So, uh, you know, is listening to this podcast for for different people producing different levels of cognitive demand? For example, depending on their level of familiarity with this subject. Yes, um, uh, absolutely, and. Again, I think that the idea of cognitive demand is relative to the individual as well as what they want their, their brain to, to function best at. Um, however, when we think about cognitive demand, I think there's, there's multiple different ways that you can come at it. So when I think about 
generating skills um, or maybe just brain development more broadly to start with. You, know, you might think about how does uh, a toddler interact with their environment such that they're developing motor skills, language skills, social skills. And it's often this you know, concerted effort for a short period of time where you are right at the limit of your current capacity, being able to stand, being able to walk, being able to climb a tree, being able to pronounce a certain word. And then, um, you, know, you know, maybe you could put, put a time frame on it, maybe it's somewhere between you know, 20 or 30 minutes, something like that. You know, could, you know, adults may be able to do this for longer. Um, right at the ed edge of your skill set. And then, you know, probably there's some failure in there because the process of failure sort of upregulates our the, the processes of focus and, and attention as well, up to a point before we get frustrated. Uh, and then there's some rest and recovery. Your toddler is going to sleep a bunch after they spent uh, a lot of time exploring the environment, trying to improve their, their, their motor skills. And I think that kind of provides an idea of the type of focused attention um, that you put into something that then drives plastic reorganization, which is what we care about. We want to try and drive an increase in functional capacity in some domain uh, of cognitive function. And so it's probably going to be something that, that looks like that. Um, and there are benefits to continually doing things at the level of your current uh, capacity, right? If you're an athlete, you're not always pushing the boundaries. You, you know, you're not always doing a red line session that, that drives a bunch of adaptation. So, that, and, and I think that the brain is similar, um, but that's very different from how most adults perform in their day-to-day -day work. Where yes, it's very, it feels cognitively demanding, but you're multitasking, task switching, so you're never providing focused attention on a specific subject. Um, and you're also not really providing that sort of stimulus to increase skill in a specific area necessarily. Um, so even though so you, even though you feel busy, even though something feels cognitively de demanding, I don't think that those um, stimuli are the same in terms of what's what's driving um, you know a, 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 a functional change um, in some some area of the brain. Yeah, it's a very important point you raise, and it of course always begs a question that I have when people tell me or when I feel this way myself that, you know, I just can't remember things. I'm just not as facile cognitively. And and I always just wonder where distraction and lack of mm. focus fits into the mix. So um, are there any kind of heuristics for what is too much task switching? What is too much distraction? Because as you said, it's you feel very busy sometimes, and and I I actually went through a little bout of this yesterday. I was really trying to get a lot of things done, and then one more thing got put on my plate, and I had this window of ten minutes where I accomplished literally nothing by t by toggling back and forth between three different emails, text, WhatsApp, and a document I was trying to work on, and I I just couldn't get anything done. I mean that's. To be that debilitated is pretty unusual for me, but in that moment, or, or that was in that 10 minutes, I, I, I accomplished exactly zero. I would have been better off for 10 minutes literally just walking around the house or walking around the block. Um, so, so clearly there was sort of a threshold there, but, but do you have any way to think about what that looks like and where you've crossed a line into being you know, busy and unproductive rather than busy and productive or focused and productive? So I would, probably make the argument that humans in general cannot multitask in the way that you describe it. Um, and again, we can sort of break this out. There are probably two different types of, of multitasking. Um, one is the performance, the automatic performance of learned subroutines that kind of just happen and you could do multiple of them at the same time. So say you're a dancer um, and you're running subroutines, the, the steps you've learned, interacting with a partner, inter, you know, listening to the music. You, know, you are technically multitasking, but those are all sort of learned subroutines that are essentially happening automatically or you know, subconsciously. What you're describing as multitasking is that process of focusing on one thing, then another thing, then another thing. And we know that there's a loss function in terms of the, t you know, the time it takes to get back onto a new task from, from the previous task. And it's something in the order of, you know, like people have said 20 something seconds, right? For you to, to kind of uh, 
refocus onto something. So say you're, you know, switching your focus every minute or two, the amount of time you actually have to, to focus on one specific task is dramatically reduced because, you know, a significant portion of that is just spent with your brain figuring out what it is you're asking it to do. So in that setting, um, so say you're, you're doing things that allow you to, to enact, learn subroutines in your work. You could probably do that continuously and there's less of this sort of stressful demand uh, on, on, your, on your attention. But if you're needing to directly focus on multiple things at the same time, then switching from one to the other, I would argue that the majority of people cannot do that well, even though they may think that they can. Yeah, one way that I think about this in terms of exercise is if I'm doing a, a steady state, you know, aerobic efficiency, we you know, call it a zone two workout on a stationary bike, I can listen to a podcast and an audio book mm -hmm. and be completely focused on it. I can still manage to be on a bike and pedal. I don't have to worry about traffic or anything like that. And I can be focused. But if I'm doing mm -hmm. a higher intensity cardio workout or if I'm lifting weights, I can't listen to podcasts and books. The, those tasks just demand a little bit more of my attention either to not get hurt or just to focus on the movement. In other words, they're not as, you know, presumably automatic as just holding 90 RPM at a fixed wattage riding around. Yeah. Uh, so, so would you, would you say that that's kind of an example of something that's, you know, really automatic versus something that's just a high enough order of processing where you can really only do that one thing? Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a good way to, to think about it. Um, and m more broadly, I think that, you know, traditional work-based multitasking is probably the point where there's this biggest gap between perceived demand and the amount of beneficial cognitive stimulus you're actually getting. Mm. Um, and it reminds me of something that a, a former colleague of mine at Hintza, James Hewitt, well, some, uh, he also used to be a professional cyclist and he, he calls this the cognitive middle gear. Mm. And it's this, this, this point where effort is high, but uh, sort of the end product is minimally useful. Um, and if you can think about uh, athletes who may go out and thrash themselves at threshold for like an hour and do that every day, it's very hard, right? And they, it feels really hard. But in terms of physiological adaptations that improve performance, yep. there's a big gap between how hard it is and benefit. And yeah, I think it's, it's a this physiological kind of multitasking no man's is the same. Land. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There, it's, it's, not, it's, it's too hard to give them the wide aerobic base and not hard enough to give them that peak performance. Well, well, this is actually kind of a nice quick way to segue, and I want to come back to this, but just let's talk about Formula One for a second. So, <sighs> you know, you and I have been fans of this sport for a very long time, but I think a lot of people listening to this have become fans of F1 through Netflix's uh, Drive to Survive series. Of course, if you're listening to this and you don't know what Drive to Survive is, I, I recommend you go back and watch the last two seasons at least. Um, but I think anybody who's watched the sport will appreciate how much they need to be able to do while driving. And on a personal level, this is something I can relate to because I spend a lot of time in a car and in a simulator and I am nowhere near being able to do what a driver does. So for folks to get a sense of this, first of all, they're traveling at speeds that are simply unbelievable, right? Their straight line speed is, you know, 200 to 200 and up to 220 miles an hour, depending on the, the, the setup they have for that race. And the amount of things that they have control over on this computer that masks arrayed as a steering wheel in front of them is unbelievable, right? So between every corner, they're making some adjustment. They're switching the brake bias with one knob, which shifts the emphasis or force between how much brake is on the front wheels versus the rear. They're altering the slip angle of the differential, which is allowing inner wheels versus outer wheels when they're going around corners to move at different relative speeds. They're obviously adjusting drag reduction system when appropriate. They're adjusting access to battery power if they're passing or overtaking or trying to defend. I mean, there's simply no shortage of things. Oh, and by the way, they're pushing a radio button to talk to their engineer who's talking to them the whole while. So I will just say, Tommy, I have been driving for nine years 
I can't come close to managing all of these variables in the simulator even, let alone, I mean, the most I can handle when I'm driving is driving and talking and maybe adjusting brake bias here and there. But but I'm, I'm just so beyond my capacity to do any more. So how do these guys do so much? And I think more importantly for those of us who can't, what do we need to do to get better at that capacity? Or is it just so sport specific? And because these guys have been driving carts since they were five, things that I have to think about while driving, they don't. Is that, is that simply what it comes down to? I, I honestly think that's, that's a lot of it. Um, many of the things they're doing, you know, like we talked about th this idea of multitasking being running several learned subroutines at the same time, which the, which the human brain is, is, is very good at. That's essentially what they're doing for a lot of those, a lot of those functions. Um, and if you've spent your entire life as a race, as a racing driver, which they have essentially, right? they've been casting since they were young kids, um, these guys, then, you know, when the compute setup changes, uh, or, you know, there are new things on the car based on new regulations, right? They're just stripping off a top layer and adding on a new one. So like, the, what they have to learn is very minimal compared to everything else that, that's, that's probably happening automatically. So yes, I mean, there's a huge um, cognitive demand and then probably a lot of what, you know, they're actually using their, their brain power for in the moment is, you know, you know reacting to others, right? You, that's, that's, yeah, it's you, can't, you can't learn that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so that's where most of their attention is and everything else is, is, is probably is, is happening automatically. Now, when you have drivers that move up the ranks and there's a pretty big jump from F3 to F2 from a complexity of the car standpoint, and again, from F2 to F1, are there things that coaches will do with the drivers during those big transition years to really help them get up to speed? Um, you know, I'll give you an example. I don't think this is an example of what I'm accomplishing, but just people are probably very familiar with watching the drivers before races play sort of half physical, half cognitive games, right? Mm -hmm. Where they have like little lights on a board and they have to touch them or they're playing catch or juggling or doing all these sorts of things. Are those things doing anything to sharpen their brain or do they just look cool? It probably a, a bit of both, but I would argue that um, for some drivers, it, it certainly seems to, to be beneficial and it's very different from, from driver to driver. Um, however, uh, there are definitely drivers who, you know, when they move up the ranks or even, you know, those who have been in Formula One for a long time, they'll have uh, a dummy steering wheel, right? So they can, you know, move through the patterns of, of doing everything, you know, even if they're not on track. And this is, this is often the same as, you know, when we were learning subroutines. So, so say you're learning a new dance, you'll do the steps one by one without music, then you'll start to, then you'll start to string them together, right? Then you'll add complexity. You'll, and you know, it's the, it's the same thing. So there are multiple opportunities for them to practice some of these skills, even though they don't get a huge amount of time actually racing on, on, on the track. Um, when you're thinking about the, these sort of reaction um, games that some drivers are doing, and, and some of them may, may do it in terms of you know, practicing starts, um, and again, you know, they'll have sort of a, a dummy setup to do that, or you know, balls and, and reaction, uh, you know, reacting to somebody throwing something. Um, some of it is probably, um, some of it may be placebo, right? It helps them feel like they're, they're getting ready, which is great, and anything you can do to improve that, you know, you would welcome. But then the other part of it may be moving you onto the appropriate part of the Yerkes Dodson arousal, cur arousal curve, right? Which basically says that there's this U shape or inverted U shape curve of like how aroused you are and how you perform. Mm -hmm. And that curve is different based on the sport. Um, and so some period where you're having to focus and react, but also remain relatively relaxed. Um, because that's that's incredibly important, right? You want to be fast off the start line, but then the first thing you have to do is get into turn one when you have eight guys around you trying to navigate at the same thing, and you have to re you have to react to them. So if you were very tense, you know that that would uh, decrease your performance in that setting. So I think some of it is just getting you to the point where you're focused, but then also relaxed. You know, if you're doing it with with a with a some kind of skill based thing that requires you to also um, you know, be relatively fluid. So it could be like catching a ball suddenly, right? You can't do that if you're very stiff and tense. So it, I think it's some, you know, some of it's this balance of getting into the right, 
mindset before you then you have to, have to do do something once you get into the car. Now, most of us have, you know, we're never going to be professional drivers or athletes. And certainly as we're aging, those, the need for really complex motor skills and cognitive skills may go down. But what is the equivalent that you think about for a person as they reach middle life and they're thinking about transitioning, you know, or what lies ahead of them as they, as they transition into, into older age? In other words, what is that apex set of skills that they need to be able to have to give them the the highest amount of physiologic headroom possible to avoid or minimize this age related decline and and more importantly potentially even avoid the pathologic stuff that we haven't talked about yet but we'll come to I, I think a lot of it again is probably quite individual right if you want to be able to perform a specific task, right? You want to be able to drive cars for as long as you're able, right? Mm -hmm. The next four or five decades. So then you would you would want to push your skills as far as you can in that arena while, while you're able. And then you have, like you said, maybe we'll talk about more about this idea of headroom. You you cannot, at least not yet, we cannot completely stop the aging process but you may be able to slow the decline and or if you increase your the the level of capacity it will take longer to get to a point where you know function is lost such that you can no longer engage in that activity um the you know when you're thinking about the brain you know there's a whole bunch of things related to language skills um obviously um memory is important um but how you interact with your environment and and I think social interaction is, is critically important and something that is, is probably um, under discussed in relation to long term cognitive function. That's, that's that's a critical aspect as well, particularly as people spend less time um, with others, um, uh, sort of because of uh, societal uh, effects. But when you think broadly about how cognitive function declines with age it seems to mirror very closely the amount of demand that we put on our brains. And again, across you know, how society is constructed. Because cognitive function essentially increases from birth to some peak in late teens or in your early 20s, which is the period of formal education. It is your job to learn, right? It's your job to develop skills. That's when most sports are learned. Um, that's when languages are learned. That's when skills are learned. And then after that, you essentially spent a, bun a bunch of time doing the same thing over and over. Or you become hyper-specialized in one specific skill, and that's rewarded in, in a number of jobs, right? And so say you're a surgeon, you want a lot of those processes to be automatic. You don't want to have to think about all of them continuously, right? So it's beneficial. It makes you better at your job. Um, but there's much less uh, room for that period of, of skill building or putting in you know, effort into developing or providing those kinds of stimuli that then drive plastic reorganization in the brain and may increase headroom. So I think some of that natural decline with aging is a function of how we use our brains in general uh, in society. And then there's a, a, a drop off when we retire and we can we can see that in, in various different types of data sets where those who retire earlier seem to experience cognitive decline sooner. And that's probably because the, the cognitive demand that we do get in our daily lives, the majority of that comes comes from work. So the you know, an important answer I think is, you know, if you're trying to maintain a basic set of cognitive functions, is to actively work on ways to increase headroom, increase absolute capacity throughout the lifespan. Because I mean, at some point, capacity will decrease, but you want to push that out as far as you can, you know, hopefully you'll die of something else before, you know, you lose, you know, the majority of your cognitive capacities. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think everybody's aware of the anecdote, right? Where boy, you know, Sally was just sharp as a tack and then she retired and all of a sudden it all went to hell in a handbasket. But, mm -hmm. you know, you hear this so many times that you realize there must be something to this. It it can't just be, 
you know, an observational phenomenon that's best explained by something else. There may be other contributors to it. Mm. Maybe people who are retiring younger also have more health challenges. Maybe they're of lower socioeconomic status. I mean, you could come up with a lot of confounders that could explain this. Yeah. yeah. But but I suspect that there is also a signal there. There's some fire in the in the uh, uh, the presence of that smoke that says, you know, if you retire and in its place add nothing cognitively, um, mm. you know, w you could expect to see a decline. I also can't help but wonder how much of this has to do with sense of purpose, which again, I think maybe falls outside of kind of, you know, we're now getting, we're, we're getting really warm and fuzzy outside of the scientific <laughs> discussion, but, but you know, it's a, it, the question I always have is, look, retirement should be thought of maybe as a financial decision. Maybe retiring means I no longer need to work for money, but I'm going to work on something else. And mm. if that something else is not as cognitively demanding, right? Let's say you go from being an accountant where, you know, it's pretty cognitively demanding. You have to be, you know, you're in a spreadsheet all day. Um, and you say, well, look, I'm 65. I'm done with that. And I don't need to work anymore. But now I'm going to go and do something in the, you, you know, I'm going to do something philanthropic where I'm going to work for, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in homelessness as an example. I'm going to go and do X, Y, and Z. Well, you, you probably have more sense of purpose. You might derive more satisfaction from that, uh, even though it's not as cognitively challenging. Do we have any sense of how that factors into it, or is that just so far outside of our ability to to kind of understand risk? The majority of, of studies that have looked at this have, I guess they fall into two camps, which partially answer your question, but don't necessarily answer it fully. Um, the... The first is looking at you know, the removal of that stimulus through, through retirement. It's been done in, in several population-based studies. They usually account for medical conditions that you know, might cause you to retire early because that's an important, that's an important confounder. Um, and when you look at other studies, there are, you know, there's evidence to suggest that late in life cognitive activity, so whether you regularly play chess or you dance or you do something else that, that that's cognitive stimulating that's protective against um, incident dementia or cognitive decline um, so the two parts of that would say that removal of work as a major cognitive stimulus in increases risk but that adding some other kind of cognitive stimulus mitigates that risk um, and there are several studies where you do some kind of cognitive training. Maybe it's a computer-based brain training in older adults in their you know, 70s. You can see significant improvements in cognitive function. Um, and if you think about all the things that are most protective in terms of, of preventing cognitive decline, there was a, a big meta-analysis done by uh, uh, Jintai Yu, who's a uh, professor in Shanghai, looking at all the different potentially modifiable factors for cognitive decline. The two most important protective ones were early in life education, which I think of as increasing headroom. So the more you learn and skills you develop early in life and the longer you do that for, the greater headroom you have. And then late in life cognitive activity, which then provides that protective factor. So I think there's enough evidence, you know, as much as we can right now, and most of this is observational, although there are some interventional trials in older adults, you can say that if you're no longer working, if you replace it with cognitively stimulating activities, you're probably mitigating, you know, all of that risk, or at least most of it. And we've discussed this a little bit in the podcast in the past that not all cognitive tasks are created equal. So, you know, for example, uh, my reading of the literature was there was, wasn't any evidence that doing crossword puzzles is necessarily going to do anything for you other than mm -hmm. make you better at doing crossword puzzles. Um, yeah. But dancing, no, that's a bit different actually, um, mm -hmm. because no two steps are ever exactly the same. You're always sort of problem solving, especially if it's sort of complicated dance. Um, you know, solving a business problem is more elaborate than doing Sudoku or whatever it's called, where it's, you know, mm -hmm. they're just sort of little predictable word games. And so um, would you agree that maybe what you replace it with, there's also some variability in the complexity of that. And the less color by numbers or paint by numbers it is, the more likely it is to, well, I mean, let's use that example, painting by numbers versus painting, right? The, you're both painting, but in one case, yeah. it's a much higher level of, of, of cognitive load. 
Yeah, and I think there are there are two streams of evidence that that are maybe that maybe support this. So one is around uh, cognitive activities performed on a computer. So there are a, a number of different ways to do online brain training. Um, there's a system called Brain HQ, which probably has the best um, evidence to support. It was actually developed by um, one of the researchers who sort of did um, a whole bunch of the sort of primary basic research in terms of how we learn in the first place uh, back in the 90s. Um, and they've, they have some nice data that shows that if you do these complex uh, training games, which are often uh, reacting to something uh, or you know shifting focus, right? Uh, they, they require you to be, they're very interactive. Then you can see parallel improvements in things like uh, verbal memory and executive function. So things that you actually care about in real life. You're not just getting better at the game, yeah. you're getting better at certain cognitive functions, which is what you really care about. And that, that program is um, called what? Brain HQ. And that's something that people uh, would do online? That's like a game you yes. would play online? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a subscription service. I have no relationship with it. But in terms of online brain training systems, it's been used in a, in a bunch of clinical studies. It's probably the, the, the best evidenced one in terms of creating sort of translational improvements in function. And then related to that, there are also studies using uh, video games um, where if you randomize people to play Solitaire versus Angry Birds versus um, Mario 3D, um, like the the 3D um, the 3D game results in better improvements in uh, working memory and um, uh, there are, there is some response inhibition which is a version of um, executive function. So the more complex, the more interactive something is, the it seems to be the, the the greater the improvements in cognitive function associated with it. Then related to that is work in uh, physical activity. Mm. So you mentioned dancing. There are studies that have compared dancing to um, uh, circuit training that is as cardiovascularly uh, challenging, but obviously without that element of social interaction, music, movement, steps, re you know, reacting. Yep. Um, and, and you see uh, better improvements in the dancing group. And some people have termed this um, open skill versus closed skill um, physical activity. So closed skill is, you know, unidirectional, doing the same thing again and again. So like sitting on, a, on an exercise bike um, inside. You're not doing anything else at the same time, except maybe listening to a podcast, um, versus, uh, say, table tennis or badminton. So the the physical nature of it, the the cardiovascular stimulus is the same, but you're not reacting to the environment um, and, and and other people. And when you do those open skill uh, type of physical activities, you seem to see some some sort of greater improvements in in, in uh, co uh, cognitive abilities. So there's there are those various things that say that. The more domains or the more complex the interaction, you know, associated with the activity, the the greater the associated improvements. Yeah, the more variability there is, right? It's you know, to be able to walk outside on an uneven surface, where you know the slope is constantly changing, and you kind of have to be able to phys physically and cognitively be aware of what's beneath your feet. It's going to be a lot better for you than walking on a treadmill mm -hmm. or even walking around yeah. a track in circles. Um, so. So let's talk a little bit now about the pathology side of this thing. So again, I think listeners to this podcast have have a decent understanding about Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's pathology. We've certainly had a number of podcasts on the topic, but but maybe let's just kind of refresh people's memories on the difference between Alzheimer's disease specifically and perhaps other kinds of dementia, such as vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, uh, Lewy body dementia for that matter, and maybe even forms of dementia that don't necessarily fit neatly into these uh, boxes. Like you said, those 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 are probably the four main types uh, of dementia. Although there there are other ones that then are associated with maybe other neurodegenerative conditions. So uh, uh, the types of dementia associated with Parkinson's disease or or ALS, they can be sort of complex and 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 multi-domain, and you might see changes in different areas of the brain. What the main thing that ties together Alzheimer's disease, and this is something that's worth digging into because I think both the the genesis of the the uh, the eponym uh, as well as how we now use it um, is, is very interesting, but the thing that kind of ties together forms of Alzheimer's disease and there are, there are you know two as we think about them early onset uh, Alzheimer's disease and late onset Alzheimer's disease. But what really ties them together is the the neuro neuropathology. 
which is if you slice somebody's brain open, um, particularly, again, within the medial temporal lobe, that's where sort of like the, the primary you know, atrophy uh, and pathology seems to exist, although it can be uh, throughout the brain, is amyloid plaques and uh, tau tangles, hyperphosphorylated uh, tau uh, within the neurons. And this was how the disease was originally uh, classified. There was a, uh, an initial case, uh, August uh, D, who uh, Alzheimer treated in um, an asylum for several years and then looked at her brain after she died and he saw these things under a microscope, then collected other cases where they saw similar things. And this was done right at the beginning of uh, biological psychiatry where, you know, trying to find uh, biology that, that, that explained uh, psychiatric symptoms. And one of the things you could do at the beginning of the 20th century was look at things under a microscope, you know, after that person had died. And that's, that's, that's how they classified it. However, um, you know, what, whenever you want to, we can get into how actually these pathological hallmarks correlate very poorly with somebody's symptom burden and disease progression. And the reasons why they they accumulate may be very different from person to person and, and may matter much less from one person uh, to the next. However, it's these pathological hallmarks that created the classification of what we call Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's funny, I wrote about this story in in my chapter on on Alzheimer's disease and and pointed out that I, many years later, uh, you know, they exhumed, I guess, part of, uh, part of her brain and, um, lo and behold, she actually didn't have the sort of typical Alzheimer's disease that we see today, which is mm -hmm. what the disease that 99% of people with Alzheimer's disease get a very small subset. She was in that subset, get a variant of the disease that is genetically predetermined. Uh, and I can't remember which one she had. I think she had PSEN1 uh, or did she have APP? I don't, I don't no, know. It, it was, it was PSEN1, but that's actually quite hotly disputed. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, there was a paper in Lancet uh, Neurology 2013 where they they sequenced her brain and yeah. and they they supposedly found this mutation. But then another group got another mm. sample of her brain and couldn't find any mutations um, associated oh, with f familial or early onset Alzheimer's disease. So um, there's actually and then though her if she did have uh, early onset you know a monogenic autosomal, autosomal dominant mutation. Um, it didn't seem there were you know some some people have looked into her family history afterwards and her children didn't seem to get it so even if she had um, a spontaneous mutation it didn't seem to be passed on so there are a lot of people who think that actually there's no evidence that she had um, wow. a mutation. Well, that, that that may be the first correction I need to make in the uh, second edition of my book <laughs> because I, I noted that that she in fact did have it or PSEN one and as a result it may be a different disease entirely, right? It may mm. be that PSEN1 mutation, PSEN2, APP mutations, which are all these essentially, essentially autosomal dominant deterministic mutations that result in people getting this disease and getting it very early. I mean, this is mm. not uncommon for someone to be stricken in their, in their 40s um, and certainly be dead before they're 60. Um, what is the alternative explanation? If in fact she did not have any of those mutations, um, what is the best case explanation for her disease, its severity, and the histologic findings. Hmm. So, uh, by some telling of, of the story, um, as uh, after examining her brain, Alzheimer's was encouraged, supposedly by his mentor, Emil Kraplin, to gather together cases to sort of build this idea of this, of this sort of common pathologic process. And Again, it's sort of, you know, you're recounting history, so it, it depends on, on who's telling it. Mm. But some people say that actually Alzheimer was quite reluctant to try and group these people together because they were so different. Um, and I know you've uh, sort of mentioned that, that famous line, which is that once you've seen one case of Alzheimer's, you've seen one case of Alzheimer's, right? They're, they're all so very different. And apparently this is something that Alzheimer felt as well. He wasn't sure that they should be mm. grouped together. In the version of the story where she doesn't have an autosomal, uh, autosomal dominant mutation in PSEM1. Um, it's that she did have some kind of um, decrease in her cognitive faculties. Um, 
and that which led her, you know, which, you know, there are a whole bunch of environmental or other factors that, that could, could play into that. We could certainly talk about that. But it led her husband to then put her into an asylum. And we know that one of, uh, you know, the fastest ways to, to trigger cognitive uh, impairment or cognitive decline is to basically remove somebody from their environment and completely remove all stimulus, social, in social interaction and all the things that ground them in, you know, who they are. So that version of the story says that because of the asylum that she was put in and the way that she was sort of completely disconnected from her normal environment, um, that then triggered an acceleration uh, in her in her cognitive decline, which then you know maybe a, a sort of a you know, sort of like a, a maximized version of of what we might see in in individuals uh, nowadays who experience uh, cognitive impairment and then dementia. Do we know her APOE four status when they were looking for PSEN one? Did they check APOE? That's a good question, but I don't I don't know if they checked that or if anybody's checked that or if they have, I, I haven't seen yeah. it. So so let let's sort of talk about the current state of affairs with Alzheimer's disease. And let's go back to a point you made earlier. Do you know what the discordance is between the presence of uh, amyloid beta on a histologic sample, obviously taken post-mortem, and the presence of and or even severity of dementia-related symptoms in that person while they were alive, and the contrapositive of that, which is to say the severity of symptoms in a person while they were alive and the absence of amyloid beta on a pathologic specimen after they've died. What, what is the, because in an ideal world, it would be a one-to-one -one mapping that is 100% concordant. Hmm. Anyone who has symptoms will have amyloid beta on autopsy and nobody who doesn't have symptoms will, and anybody who doesn't have symptoms never has it, and nobody who doesn't have symptoms will have amyloid, right? It's a, it's a perfect one-to-one -one mapping. Well, it's clearly not that. So how messy is it? You, it would be nice if we could, you know, put an, uh, an R squared or an R value um, uh, on this to see how tightly correlated they are. Um, I think, you know, I have to reach deep into the, the depths of my memory. And if, if people have tried to do that kind of um, correlation, it's, you know, the, the R is somewhere around 0.1 or something. Um, so, you which, know, which just means for people, it's virtually uncorrelated. Yeah, there's a couple of percentage points, maybe, in the variability in cognitive function that's explained by uh, the variability in or the amount of amyloid that, that you have. And that's very clearly described in animal models as well as uh, in humans. And we also, you know, there are several studies where they've made some very good drugs that can, you know, decrease plaque burden in the brain, but that doesn't seem to then correlate uh, with later cognitive, um, cognitive functions. And may have a high risk of, of side effects, although that's a whole other story that we won't, don't need to get into today. Um, so pretty much anybody who dies with dementia or experiences dementia will have some burden of amyloid plaque and, and tau tangles. Um, I don't think I know of a case where somebody had that without any. Um, and, but we also know that these things naturally accumulate uh, over time. And you can have people, you know, there are multiple cases where they've looked at the pathology where you have significant um, a, a burden of these neuropathological hallmarks with no decrease uh, in, in cognitive function. And so I think there's, or, or beyond what might be expected given that person's age. And so I think that opens, you know, th there's a possibility that there's some, you know, there's some other factor. People are now thinking about other things that may come into play here. So. Um, microglial uh, function phenotype and so microglia are the, the main immune cells of the brain these are now be, being increasingly interrogated in in Alzheimer's disease dementia you know other processes might be important so uh, lysosomal function um, is potentially uh, important as well which, which basically processes proteins uh, for breakdown and you know that gets impaired and that may trigger some of the accumulation of some of these things but the alternative is to maybe think that some of some of these hallmarks may be epiphenomenal, right? They just accumulate um, in the face of neuronal stresses, and, I, and I'm and I'm speaking about this largely or pretty much only in in the case of late onset Alzheimer's disease. Your brain is going to get exposed to a bunch of things, um, be that decreasing metabolic function, be that smoking, vascular disease. And then as neurons get stressed, they start to, to secrete 
uh, some of these proteins or accumulate some of them. And there are some lines of evidence that suggest that some of it's a, actually a, a beneficial response. So uh, amyloid beta has some antimicrobial and metal chelating effects. So it may be this actually a response mm. to a stress that's then supposed to be protective. Um, you get to a point, and they've shown this very clearly in animal models, where if you can force amyloid plaques to accumulate in large numbers, where they do start to become damaging in their own right. Uh, but up to that point, um, it, it may be more of an epiphenomenon or a, you know, a response to a neuronal stress rather than this core sort of underlying um, pathological process. Yeah, there's so much there to think about, right? So, so on the one hand, you could say, well, look, is, is amyloid beta necessary but not sufficient for amyloid plaque? So the classic example, that would be ApoB, right? ApoB is necessary mm -hmm. but not sufficient for atherosclerosis. Uh, you have to have it, but by itself, it's not enough. You also have mm -hmm. to have inflammation and endothelial damage or dysfunction for the ApoB particle to get in there and cause damage. But ApoB is causally related, and that's why reducing ApoB reduces events. It's necessary, but not sufficient. If that were true of amyloid, it could ex explain part of the observation that lots of people have amyloid without symptoms because it's only necessary, yeah. but by itself it's not sufficient. But that wouldn't necessarily imply causality because it would, to have causality, you would have to say removing amyloid because it is necessary, though not sufficient, removes the disease. And as of yet, to your point, we don't really have evidence of amyloid reducing strategies working. Now, the the flip side to that, which I know people will argue, is it might be because those, and I don't know where I stand on this, I'm, I'm very confused mm -hmm. by this, it might be that, well, we're applying those therapies too late. Yeah. And if you applied amyloid reducing therapies earlier, if we knew how to target people long before they were at the doorstop of MCI, maybe we could do something about it. In this sense, it's sort of like saying, well, you know, lowering ApoB a week or a month or even a year before someone has an MI probably isn't going to help. Um, but doing so 10 years before will. So how do you think about the causality and the, 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 the necessary but not sufficient argument and, and also this temporal argument of if, if in fact ApoB is playing a, a role, we may be way outside of our window to do anything about it. I'm open to that idea still, though I am skeptical based on the range of animal and human, human evidence so far. Um, it's possible that um, amyloid beta is necessary, uh, but, that, but, but if it is necessary, we don't have evidence that it is sufficient uh, to cause um, dementing processes. There's been some some recent uh, work in this area that that sort of I feel you know supports the idea that that maybe it may not even be necessary or sufficient. Um, mm. Which is uh, there was a recent uh, this uh, process called Panthos pathological anthos, which is pathological flower. Uh, this was uh, published by Ralph Nixon's group out of NYU last year, and what they showed was that you know in a, a specific knockout model in mice. Um, this, you know, when we traditionally think about amyloid plaque accumulating, we think about it accumulating outside the neuron. And it's sort of like this whole bunch of protein that's kind of just sticking together. And eventually that is injuring the neurons around it. It's being secreted, it's accumulating, uh, you know, aggregating, and then it's, it, it's causing damage that way. What they show with some, some really nice techniques is that what's actually happening, um, at least in this model, is that amyloid is accumulating inside the neuron. It is um, aggregation uh, inside failing lysosomes, which is supposed to pr process proteins. And they aggregate within the neuron, which then lyses, right? The, the, the cell dies, it disappears, and you leave a plaque in its place. It sort of like burst the, the neuron open. And so in that setting, uh, there's a nice quote by, by Nixon that says that um, if you're trying to remove amyloid, it's the same thing, you know, to, to try and treat Alzheimer's disease. It's the same thing as trying to uh, revive somebody uh, from the dead by removing their tombstone. Um, that's, that's essentially mm. what it is. The, the plaque is the tombstone of a previous neuron 
that failed uh, its ability wow. to, to process protein and then left this in its place. There's still a lot of work to be done to say, is this what's actually happening in humans, which you know haven't been sort of genetically manipulated as we do with a lot of you know mouse models. Um, but but that's that, a very stark setting, concept, right? That, that's a yes, very stark concept is. because it implies that amyloid is an absolute marker for something horrible, just as walking through a town and seeing lots of tombstones tells you if they occurred over a short enough period of time, something bad happened in this town. But yeah. removing the tombstones does nothing to erase what just happened in that town. Um, exactly. What is the what is the critical response to their model? So the people that would be on the uh, amyloid is at a minimum necessary, maybe even sufficient. How would they be critical of of Nixon's work? So I think you could you could say that um, even. Even if that's the case, even if this is not, if this is intracellular accumulation, all you've done is you've moved the site of initial accumulation. Uh, if it does hold in humans, and that maybe that 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 would be the first major criticism is is show that this happens in humans, and I think that they're they're working on some pathological samples to 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 see whether this is the case. Um, you could say, well, okay, first show that this is how it works in humans, and then you could say, well, even even if that's the case, all you've done is you've moved the amyloid from outside the cell to inside the cell where it first accumulates. So that doesn't then stop it, you know, causing damage, being a primary causative factor because, you know, once that either the, the first neuron itself and then the structures around it could still be, could still be uh, damaged um, or, you know, because then you might get uh, microglial activation, right? You get this immune response, right? That, that can then trigger some of the downstream processes. So, so I think there's still a possibility that even if that's the, even if that is the process as it happens, you know, you could still say, oh, well, everything else is still the same. So let's talk about some of the other ideas, Tommy, and, and we, we can talk about some of them broadly, but I, I'd like to also hear sort of if you were, if you were, uh, you know, Alzheimer's czar for a day and it was your, <laughs> your job to allocate, <laughs> allocate funding for both um, prevention and treatment, Right. So to, 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 if you were going to allocate those types of dollars, presumably you'd want to have a strong sense of where to put those resources. But, but what are some of the other theories, right? Sort of vascular, metabolic, uh, you know, obviously there's a genetic component. So, so just tell me where you think it sort of shakes down and then, and then we can go from there as to what the implication is from where maybe we ought to be spending our resources. It's important. You know, we've gotten this part, you know, this far, I've talked a lot about. Uh, Alzheimer's disease. It's important for me to mention that um, a lot of the the work and thought I've done in this arena is is not on my own. You know, I primarily have worked a lot with uh, Dr. Josh Turknett, who is a neurologist, which I am not, um, and obviously has a lot of sort of front facing experience in this. And so, a lot of these ideas as they come together, you know, we we wrote a paper about the demand model. That's where you know some of this discussion comes from. But it's very, it's very much a collaboration with, with, with him and others. So I, I won't pretend that I suddenly figured anything out by myself because I certainly didn't. Um, nor can I say that I figured it out or else I'd uh, be getting an invite from the King of Sweden uh, sometime to go and, to go and meet him. Um, but when we look at late onset Alzheimer's disease, I think we've gotten to the point where there's such a broad number of environmental and lifestyle-based risk factors that seem to be critically important. Um, that's really where I would focus my efforts. And <clears throat> you can definitely say that even if the, the brain is responding to neurological stresses or you know, the absence of expected inputs with the accumulation of certain pathological hallmarks, there's still some upstream process that's driving that, and that's where I would want to focus. And you know, I, I think our, our best evidence so far is in factors around diet, lifestyle, and, and you know, peripheral, peripheral health, you know, cardiovascular health being, a critical, being, being an important one. There was a, a Lancet uh, Commission report in 2020 that looked at dementia broadly and tried to estimate what amount of dementia, what proportion of dementia would be preventable. And they estimated that 40% of dementia is preventable based on you know, population attributable risk, 
and a bunch of different risk factors. Um, you know, looking at physical activity, body composition, diet quality, smoking, hearing loss, which I, I, I think of as a, as a cognitive demand, which mm -hmm. is lost, uh, ed educational status. And my guess is that this is actually an underestimate um, because they didn't include sleep. They didn't include nutrient status, particularly homocysteine uh, status, which uh, other individuals have suggested has a population attributable risk uh, of around 20% uh, for late onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then they also, you know, when, when you do these kind of assessments, right, uh, and uh, you've written about this recently, when you do a population attributable risk or population attributable, attributable fraction, you say, if we remove this entirely, what proportion of that disease would, would disappear? And we have uh, a mounting um, sort of body of evidence that says that these risk factors interact. So when you do a population attributable risk, you say, this is a linear effect, it's additive. Right, this on top of this on top of this. But in reality, we know that yeah, they're, they're actually, accretive. They're actually yeah. interactive. Yeah. yeah. So I think if you took into account other risk factors and more complex interactions between them, my guess is that the majority uh, is probably preventable uh, by focusing on some of those uh, lifestyle and environmental factors. Can you say more about the homocysteine one? Uh, we definitely manage homocysteine very aggressively. So we're mm -hmm. very liberal with our use of methylated B vitamins to keep homocysteine down. We typically target eight or nine as the mm. upper limit we wanna see, even though the lab reference range says up to 13 or 14 is normal. Uh, do you have thoughts on that? And 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 I guess also tell me about the, um, the mechanisms. Uh, we're, our concern is mostly through cardiovascular, by the way, because uh, I think mm. we, there we have pretty good evidence that homocysteine uh, impairs the clearance of two molecules, SDMA and ADMA, that impair nitric oxide synthase, which obviously has an important role in the cardiovascular uh, endothelial world. Perhaps it does in the brain as well, I'm just unaware. Yeah, so a lot of the, a lot of the work uh, in this arena, I think we have to be inde indebted to, to somebody uh, called uh, David Smith. Professor David Smith is former uh, chair and head of the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Oxford. Uh, who's done a, a huge amount of work on homocysteine and cognitive decline. Um, and actually this, this uh, dementia charity in the UK that I'm on the advisory board of, he is the chair of their scientific advisory board. Um, he has done a number of interventional studies looking at this. Uh, the main one is the Vitacog study, um, where they uh, randomized individuals with elevated homocysteine to uh, a B vitamin supplement, is a B12 and, and folate. Uh, folic acid, um, and then looked at rate of cognitive decline and rate of brain atrophy. And they showed that if you could reduce homocysteine, and the, the greatest risk is, is with those with a homocysteine above 13, there's also an elevated risk in those with a homocysteine above 11. So the cutoff that I use for cognitive decline that's based on you know hard evidence in the clinical literature is, is 11. Um, and you can, you can slow cognitive decline and brain atrophy um, if you decrease homocysteine uh, beyond that point. Um, there's a number of potential reasons for this. Uh, the first is you know, there may be a direct mechanistic effect related to the neuropathological hallmarks. So homocysteine seems to activate CDK5, which phosphorylates tau, and then also inhibit phosphatase 2A, which dephosphorylates tau. So it may contribute to the accumulation of, of tau tangles, hyperphosphorylated tau in neurons. Um, but then sort of more broadly and where I think, you know, the majority of the action is, and, and sort of excluding cardiovascular, is uh, the importance in, of the methylation cycle in um, creating functional neuronal membranes. And the reason why uh, I think uh, this is because of evidence of how homocysteine level or B vitamin supplementation interacts with omega-3 status. Um, uh, we know that if you want to try and put uh, particularly a molecule of DHA into a lipid membrane, you need to attach it or you need to create a phospholipid. Uh, and that process um, of creating phosphatidylcholine, say, which then attaches to your your DHA so it can sit in your membrane, it's, um, uh, it's very methyl intensive, right? So it requires, there are several methylation steps that, that, that require that to happen. When you look at, um, there are actually sub-analyses of several um, randomized clinical trials 
that show, so in the Vitacog study, what they showed was that the, the rate of brain atrophy was uh, only slowed in those who had in, in the highest tertiary of omega-3 status. Um, there was a study in uh, the Netherlands, the B-proof study, uh, where they, they also showed that um, the benefit was greatest in those who had the highest levels of DHA. Uh, and then there's also the omega AD st uh, study where they supplemented with EPA and DHA, but then they saw benefit in those who had the lowest levels of homocysteine. So there seems to be an interaction between B vitamin status and omega-3 status in terms of uh, cognitive decline and brain atrophy. And the best way to think about that is, is, is probably both are required in order for DHA to, to be inserted in a functional way into uh, a neuronal membrane. Um, Let's pause so there for one second, Tommy, because I, I just yeah. I, I want to make sure people understand what what it is you're 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 saying here, which is if you lower your homocysteine from thirteen or fourteen to nine or ten, all the while maybe taking some DHA, and we haven't talked about doses, but hmm. what are we thinking? One to two grams of DHA. One to two grams a day. Yeah. 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 Doing those two things together, which don't require any medical care. I mean, anybody, I've never seen a person who with, you know, the right amount of methylfolate, methyl B12, sometimes some B6 is needed. You can pretty much always get your homocysteine into that zone mm. coupled with, you know, a high quality DHEA. No affiliation with any of these companies, but I like Carlson's and Nordic Naturals as the two. Mm. Um, what would you say is the risk reduction? Would you would you say that that's a twenty percent risk reduction in all cause dementia just doing something like that? That's what others have suggested. They've calculated population attributable risks, and they've I, and it's actually it's more than that because yeah, that was just the homocysteine. Of, yeah, that was just the homocysteine. Another twenty percent has been uh, attributed to poor omega three omega, omega three status. So, so this is kind of frustrating because. I, th I know that there are literally hundreds of thousands of people listening to us speak right now whose homocysteine is elevated, whose DHEA, mm -hmm. uh, DHA is low, uh, mm -hmm. DHEA is low, and um, they are unaware and their doctors are unaware of everything you just said. And there's no drug, including a $30,000 a month drug that is going to come close to that level of prevention. So why do you think there is such a disconnect in, 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 in how we think about prevention? And we haven't even talked about the obvious stuff. Like, I'm just going to leave the obvious stuff aside. Mm -hmm. You should sleep. You know, sleep is important. Exercise is important. Not having type 2 diabetes is important. Controlling blood pressure is important. Not smoking is important. We're going to take those off the yeah. table. They're enormously yeah. important, mm -hmm. but they're so obvious we're not going to talk about them. But the homocysteine thing is not that obvious. And yet, you know, a 20% risk reduction when you're starting with an absolute risk that's as high as AD is, I mean, that's like having a winning, a winning lottery ticket in your pocket and just not knowing it. I can't explain why this is not better understood. Like when, when I've talked to physicians about this, right? I've, you know, I've had old age psychiatrists who are like, I'm immediately going to start measuring homocysteine and supplementing B vitamins, you know, plus or minus omega threes. Um, and I know, so I, I know uh, David Smith uh, a little, particularly through my work, um, sort of through this charity. And I think he's gotten to the point where it, He's incredibly frustrated. I don't want to speak for him, but it basically this pretty significant body of randomized clinical trials showing these improved outcomes has, has not been incorporated into prevention guidelines. It's not been incorporated into things like the Lancet Commission report, which looked at population attributable risk. Um, but based on you know the information we have, and this is cheap, easy to do, you know, it's easy to measure homocysteine, it's easy to measure an omega-3 index um, if you need to, or, you know, assess the, the, the DHA intake in your diet. Um, I think there's, you know, I, I can't say for certain, but I think there's massive potential benefit, you know, even if it's not 40% um, with, the, with the combination, right? Huge potential benefit here, again, you know, with, with high quality evidence to support it. Do you think there's, a, I mean, do you think there's just a bias in the medical community against non-pharmacologic interventions and, you 
I mean, look, there are a few people that are going to stand here and be more critical of the supplement industry than I am. I really mm. think it is <laughs> a, a filthy industry, especially in the United States. Uh, I, I think it's it's disgusting everywhere, but in this country, it's especially disgusting. And it, the total lack of regulation, um, mm. the complete predatory nature of it, and the total lack of quality control means that on average, it's filthy. However, that doesn't mean every supplement is, you know, a, a bad idea. And and there, are, mm. you know, I probably take a dozen supplements a day, or you know, at least nine or ten if I were to really sit there and tally them up, including, obviously, methylfolate, methyl B twelve, uh, B six, EPA, and DHA. So right off the bat, there's five. So I probably take another five. Mm. Um, but I can't help but think that there's a there's a systemic bias in the medical community against supplements. And some of that I think is probably well founded, um, yeah. Because I know how frustrated, if I'm just going to be completely honest, I get when patients show up in the practice and they have a list of forty supplements, um, and I, you know, I, I, and and I can tell just looking at them because I've done this exercise a thousand times that thirty seven of them are garbage, yeah. But three of them are worth it, and mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I, I don't. I don't know what it takes to bridge that gap, but I guess this is just an example of where you might just have to bypass your doctor and sort of say, look, I need to know what my homocysteine level is. I need to know what my EPA, mm. DHA uh, uh, levels are, and I, I can fix this on my on my own. And uh, by the way, since I'm in the process of telling people what supplements I like, especially given that I have no affiliation, I'm very happy to do this. So I prefer the Gero supplement for methylfolate and methyl B12. I just find Gero to be a very high quality supplement in general. Um, I, I'm sure there are many others out there. I, I also like the pure encapsulations B6. Um, so so those are kind of the variants I'm using. Do, do you have any supplements that you've tested or found to be particularly trustworthy as far as manufacturers go? Yeah. I. For, uh, for a lot of the supplements that I take, I like um, I like Thorn, yep. just because I, like I know well. they have a, a high, a very stringent regulatory process, and there's multiple points in the process where they test uh, mm -hmm. for um, for Im for impurities or contaminants. Um, there's also they also have a subset. Uh, so particularly, so say if I'm working with a tested athlete, that you know if you recommend a supplement, it has to be NSF for sport certified or or similar. So you know there's no banned products in there, and, and they they have a line like that. Um, pure encapsulations, I, I think is good. Uh, Momentus uh, do so, some so, some good supplements. Um, I think part of part of the problem here is that, you know, if you're, you you have to be, I mean, it depends on the, the medical system that, that you're working in, right? If you're in the UK, you're in a nationalized healthcare system. If you're over here in, in, in the US, obviously it could be several different types of system, but you, you need to be able to prescribe it. So that needs to be built into a system. And so in the UK, you can in the prescribe UK, things like vitamin D. You need to have a physician prescribe those supplements to you? No, but if you're a doctor and uh. you want your patient to take it, right, then it's very hard. There's a, there's, a, there's a big gray area where you then start recommending your patient go to the pharmacy to buy a supplement. That's a, I think part of it is, is this gray area. Whereas you're you're protected if it's you know in some respects if it's I um, see you know, I see there's this indication that you know the National Institutes of Clinical Excellence NICE have said this indication you can prescribe it or you know it's available right that there's kind of guidelines around it and so I think that's missing that's part of it. Mm, but even other physicians so like I work with a bunch of physicians who are interested in, in lifestyle medicine. Um, in lifestyle medicine, and I don't want to tar multiple people with the same, everybody with the same brush, but they're very against supplements. They're like, lifestyle medicine doesn't include supplements, right? We don't do that. And anybody who, who does recommend supplements is sort of not allowed in the club, <laughs> um, which is hugely problematic because, again, you have good, good evidence to say that there's benefit there. So, so some of it may be regulatory or, you know, what you know, the system and, and how you can get your patient these these things or or or, or whether you know the you'll, you'll get in trouble if you start getting homocysteine tests on everybody which are you know they can be tricky to do right they have to be processed quickly it's a slightly more expensive blood test compared to some other blood tests you know so and then there's also the you know there's some like you said i think there's some bias in there in terms of whether people think supplements are allowed 
or not. Gosh, it's it's really it's really frustrating. Um, yeah. Um. <laughs> All right, let's move on from from the the topic that is that is that is disappointing to me, which is one having a winning lottery ticket in your pocket and not playing it, and two, um, being such a Puritan in one's view that you wouldn't think everything is on the table, right? I mean, my view mm -hmm. is, look, Alzheimer's disease and dementia in general, very, very complicated, formidable opponent. Ideally, have as many things as possible in your, in your quiver. You should, have, you should have a jab, you should have a right cross, you should have a left hook, you should have an uppercut. <laughs> you should have all of the above to somehow suggest we only want lifestyle or we only want supplements or we only want drugs. I've never understood that rationale, but you're right. It permeates into cardiovascular medicine. It permeates into cancer. It permeates into into everything, and it's just created a bunch of silos of people who each have probably some uh, some 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 truth and some expertise, uh, but are but are you know equally limited by their blind spots. Hmm. So um, let's go back to the pathology again, just really quickly. Um, what is sort of your unifying theory on? these these things so whether it is the 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 homocysteine the uh limitation of omega-3 marine-based fatty acids we didn't even get into glucose hypometabolism but it's something we've discussed a lot on the podcast i think yeah. people are very familiar with hypometabolism whether we talk about low-grade ischemia and the vascular microvascular disease how do you think it's do you, do you think it's all working its way through a final common pathway of neuronal damage which leaves the tombstone in its wake. And that's the only thing that's basically common to them is that they leave the same tombstone. Yes, that's, that essentially summarizes my current thought process. And the, so again, working uh, with others, I think, you know, including uh, David Smith, Josh Turkner, uh, Jin Tai Yu, he, um, I mentioned earlier, he did this big meta-analysis on um, modifiable factors, uh, risk factors for cognitive decline. And, you know, trying to build this like systems approach to cognitive decline or, or late onset Alzheimer's disease. And so then my current thought process is that all of these things are necessary, healthy vascular supply, you know, some kind of metabolic substrate that is taken up um, and, and, and available to neurons of the brain, you know, that you have the, the nutrients required to build uh, quality uh, structure that you have, um, the absence of things that may impair some uh, r repair process, like you, you you mentioned a bunch of them, uh, which which are, are clear risk factors like smoking, and then you know to kind of tie everything together, you create you you require demand on the system that drives you know creates a stimulus for adaptation. Those things are required in order to respond to that stimulus, and then you have a period of recovery and adaptation that allows for you know cons consolidation and plasticity. And any individual may have an issue in one or more of those areas, but then what ties them together is the tombstone that they leave in their wake. But you know the the, the exact way that that looks, the exact number of tombstones, say, or how those tombstones look, or you know what else is going on. Is probably an expression of things like, you know, genetics uh, and, and other factors, which then explain some of that some of that variability. But that's kind of, yes, it's maybe the the, the final common pathway, but everything that's important is happening upstream of that. Before we leave dementia, I'd like to talk a little bit about one of the strongest associations I've ever seen with mitigating risk, which is strength. Um, mm. So the you know this is often demonstrated with simple measurable things like grip strength but i don't think it's that the strength of your grip and the ability to open a jar is particularly important it's just that you know very high levels of grip strength very low levels of grip strength variability here is a great proxy for overall strength people with a very mm. strong grip they're able to carry really heavy things and that requires strength all the way up and down their chain why do you think strength has such an important bearing on both the avoidance of dementia, so from an incident standpoint, and also survivability. So just to give people some numbers, when you compare the top 10% or so of people from a strength perspective to the bottom 
it's about a 70, 70 percent reduction in both incidence and mortality associated with all-cause dementia. Again, that's <laughs> when you start to think of like things that we have some control over, um, this also rises to the top of the list. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that someone at the bottom can be at the top within a year, but if you think about this mm -hmm. over the course of your life, this is all, this is something we can all aspire to. What do you think from a physiologic standpoint explains such a stark relationship? So, so when you talk about, or when my experience of talking about muscle mass and muscle strength with, you know, hard uh, outcomes, say dementia or all cause mortality. Yeah. You know, usually the response is, all right, calm down, bro. Um, clearly you like to lift weights and, you know, therefore you think that that's the answer to everything. And, um, you know, people who are healthier are stronger and that like, that's just the, the, the confounding factor. But I, I think we have, um, good evidence that, that that's not the case. Uh, the main one being that you can take individuals in their seventies, um, you can put them on a very basic resistance training program and you can see improvements both in like uh, white matter connectivity, you can do an MRI scan, or you can test them on various tests of cognitive function and you see improvements uh, as a result, um, you know, of, of, of this uh, training program. So then if you think, if you want to uh, think about potential reasons why, uh, the simplest is that some kind of novel movement is a direct neuromuscular stimulus. You are stimulating the brain to create new connections, driving plasticity because you know you're you know, the recruiting of motor fibers. That that motor skill is in itself a stimulus, a, a cognitive stimulus. But then uh, we also know that the amount of muscle, the muscle that you have, and the amount that you move it. Um, it's a it's an important glucose sink. So if you're thinking about uh, blood sugar regulation, and we know that prediabetes and type two diabetes, like you said, are significant risk factors for uh, cognitive decline and dementia. So you know it may be you know you're increase, increasing glucose flux that helps regulate blood sugar. Uh, we also you know if you're moving your muscles, uh, there's this sort of still exploding uh, area looking at myokines. Um, so things released by muscle tissue that may support. Uh, brain function, um, IGF-1, VEGF, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor that may support uh, neuronal function, be sort of survival factors to, to, to keep neurons around. Um, we know that exercise is also, you know, through a hormetic process, anti-inflammatory. So chronic inflammatory conditions we kind of mentioned earlier, but, you know, can be associated with increased risk of dementia and you're decreasing systemic inflammation uh, through, the, through physical activity. Um, so that kind of group of things, I think all of those are, are playing a role. I don't know exactly which is most important, if any. Um, frankly, I'm not sure I really care that much because I know that it's a very important intervention. So, um, and, and, and again, it's documented that it can actually work and you can implement it pretty much at any stage. So one of the reasons you know probably why one of the reasons why it is so beneficial is because it has these multiple pleiotropic effects and they're, they're probably you know add you know at least additive if not synergistic um as well as yes there, there will be a certain amount which says that the healthier you are the stronger you are so there's a little bit of that but then there's a whole bunch of things on top of that yeah when when, when i met with similar resistance uh, no pun intended to to the idea of the importance of strength and muscle mass. I, I usually respond with something which is, look, even if strength training and uh, meaning have a high degree of strength and muscle mass and cardiorespiratory fitness, even if all of those things didn't add a single day to your life, in fact, even if they shortened your life by six months, they would still more than be worth it in terms of the quality of your life, mm. especially yeah. in that final decade, which is something that most people unfortunately don't want to pay attention to until they're in that marginal decade, as I call it. And mm. you realize that at that point, having poor movement, being in pain, having low strength limits your capacity for doing just about everything that, that people would find pleasure in, whether it be playing with their kids or simply going for a walk or you know, carrying out any basic activity of daily living at the extreme level. So, um, anyway, I think I, I think it's it's a, it's a fitting way to end our discussion on this before we transition. So, 
the other thing I want to talk with you about, Tommy, is another area where where you have a great amount of expertise, and that is around head injury. Um, hmm. About, uh, oh gosh, 10 years ago, I had a friend that suffered a very significant head injury uh, riding a bike down the street, and a jogger bolted out between some parked cars, didn't notice him riding, and they hit head to head. Hmm. Uh, you know, the jogger got the worse of it because he was wearing a helmet, but nevertheless, they were both devastated by this. He was going about 40 kilometers an hour. Um, she sustained multiple fractures to her head, um, but he sustained a concussion that was so bad that basically he wasn't himself for about two years. Um, mm. He's more or less himself now. Um, can you explain what a concussion is? Even Even this... Uh, like the idea of what concussion is, is quite hotly debated. Um, but in general, you would classify a concussion as a mild traumatic uh, brain injury uh, with more severe traumatic brain injuries. You might think of like complete open skull fractures and you know, direct penetrating trauma to the brain, things like that. So this is, you know, the skull remains intact, but there has been some transmission of force or... Um, a, a, a wave, a blast wave, say if it's, if it's a blast injury that's been transferred uh, to the brain. Then at some level, in order to have symptoms of a concussion, you have some kind of disturbance of neuronal function. And that can either be because of, you know, abrupt loss. So there are some, you know, significant head uh, impacts in particular where you can get shearing of, of axons, mm -hmm. um, a, you know, direct axonal injury of, of the neurons, and then you, that you know that cell is essentially is essentially lost as you sort of ripped it apart. Um, but even more, um, you know, milder impacts may cause uh, disturbances that include like the, the a neuron firing when it shouldn't. This can then sort of create this pattern of activation again that's not expected or in an area of the, the brain where it's you know it wouldn't normally occur in a way that it wouldn't normally occur, and then this can then cause these downstream processes within cells that can cause uh, mitochondrial damage, swelling, you know, you then might see the accumulation of certain um, pathological proteins. So tau is, is it like just like you see in Alzheimer's uh, dementia, it's also a response to um, a neuro like direct neuronal injury in a concussion. I, I work with a, a neurosurgeon whose uh, definition of concussion is any impact or force to the brain that causes the disturbance of function of one neuron. Um, unfortunately, that's not something that we can measure because uh, you probably need multiple or you know large sections of the brain to, to have uh, aberrant function for, for you to be able to actually measure it or detect it. Um, but you know those are the various processes that are going you know, going on uh, you know when you get a, a head impact. So it could be as as quote unquote mild as just a headache for a few days um, following a, a head trauma, or it could be, you know, in the case of this friend of mine for a couple of years, uh, light was, they had a lot of photosensitivity. They had a lot of auditory sensitivity. They had difficulty, you know, processing things. They were much more irritable. Are, how common are those types of, you know, more severe symptoms than just a headache for a few days after a, a hit to the head? So in reality, it's quite difficult to, to say how common things are because millions of concussions happen every year in the in the US uh, alone, most of which probably go unreported. Um, and so it's only when you see more significant symptoms or, you know, something's, you know, it's happened in front of a, so you're playing sport, it's happened in front of a doctor, you know, you, you, you get a formal assessment. And, you know, the downstream effects are, you know, are varied, you know, can be around uh, you know, verbal effects, photosensitivity, um, noise sensitivity, uh, effects of memory, focus, um, reaction time, you know, depending on, on, on how you're measuring things. And probably um, some of it is exactly which area of the brain uh, was was impacted. And then there's, there's a systemic response aspect as well. So there are, um, you know, we, it's, you, you can only really do this in animal studies, but um, part of the process of of um, the the sort of the disease process after traumatic brain injury is a systemic immune response that seems to sort of contribute 
uh, to, to, to some of the symptoms. So, you know, how much of an inflammatory response do you get? How much of a fever do you get? Um, that can then, you know, cause so, some issues throughout the brain um, a, 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 as well. So what do we know about the short-term management of concussion and the long-term and what is the relationship between a concussion and a traumatic brain injury, which are terms that I think both both people are hearing, and of course the term TBI in the past decade uh, is is sort of more front and center for people. Uh, I, I suspect in large part due to two things, right? Probably uh, a greater understanding of uh, TBI occurring in the battlefield, and also in at least one sport, American football, though obviously it occurs mm. in more than that. Yeah. So, like I said, the um, concussion is generally considered, uh, you know, within the so t so all of these are TBIs, traumatic brain injuries okay. of you know var various severities. A concussion is sometimes also known as a mild traumatic TBI, mm. a mild traumatic brain injury, or MTBI. And then, and I, and I think this is where probably most of our you know focus today will be on because you know the more severe brain injuries so say if you do have skull fractures or penetrating head trauma or you have you know significant loss of consciousness that requires you know intensive care you know, that requires specialist neurosurgical treatment that's that's probably beyond what most people here will be thinking about but if instead you're thinking about concussions on the sports field or blast related or or sub concussive uh, uh, exposures, which might happen again in, uh, in sports or in the military. Um, and there's increasing evidence that says that sub-concussive um, impacts or, or blasts. So uh, an example would be sniper fire, right? You essentially have a mini explosion happening right next to your head um, several times a day, right? If you're, if, if you're in the range practicing. And there's some evidence to suggest that even that over time, the damage can accumulate and cause uh, issues with cognitive function. And there you call it subconcussive because each individual one doesn't necessarily cause symptoms, but depending on how you define uh, concussion, you may or may not get um, symptoms anyway. So there's kind of a gray area there. But you know, each individual one, would you wouldn't be able to detect it mm -hmm. really, um, but the damage seems to accumulate over time. If you have a significant um, head impact, so say on the sports field is probably again where people are most familiar with it. There's probably two aspects that are worth separating. So there's the, there's the formal medical process and medical assessment that you should undergo. And there will people who made, you know, in uh, multiple sports now, they may have some baseline cognitive testing so that when you do get a concussion, they retest you. They make sure that you get closer to uh, your previous baseline before you're allowed to play again. So things like um, the impact uh, assessment is often used in um, sort of youth and college sports. Um, and so th there's that part. But then what I'm particularly interested in is how can we mitigate the effects of an impact initially? Like are there supplementation and other strategies that we can do to make the, the athlete who's or somebody who's at high risk of concussions more resilient to that impact? Um, and are there other things that we can do to support uh, recovery or minimize the effect of of the impact so with the with the short term sort of post concussion management there are um two or three things that i think are particularly important so the first is thermoregulation and which is basically managing normal body temperature my phd was actually looking at the effects of temperature on response to brain injury uh, and it's very clear that the hotter your brain gets after an injury, the worse your outcome. Pretty much any type of brain injury, stroke, traumatic brain injury, you know, uh, also these neonatal and pediatric brain injuries that I study. And we know that a lot of sports happen in heat stressed environments. So you're on the field, you're hot already, or you're out in the sun. And if ex experimentally, if you heat that brain up first which happens during exercise and then you have an impact and then that brain stays hot that can that seems to to worsen outcomes so getting somebody out of a heat stressed environment cooling them down if you need if you need to and you, and you can use external um, external ways to do that 
You can use things like Tylenol to help uh, uh, regulate body temperature. And that particularly becomes important because this, uh, at some point, a few hours later, an inflammatory response is going to kick in and it's very common to get fever. There's been a big, um, you know, I mean, it's decades of work. How long does that, um, th does the, does the um, sort of power or potential of that intervention last? So if a person has a concussion, you know, at, two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon mm. is, should they be in an environment of taking Tylenol and cooling themselves off for the rest of the day? Or is that something that would, you'd want to carry out for a couple of days and just continue round the clock Tylenol to keep, uh, to prophylactically ward off fever? That's a great question. And it's something that the field probably still struggles with. Um, but a period of 24 to 72 hours after the initial injury is probably the most critical. Um, the, the most important thing is preventing fever. And the reason why, the reason why, uh, fever causes issues is because you create, you increase the mismatch between metabolic rate and capacity to produce mm -hmm. energy to match that metabolism. So if you have mitochondrial dysfunction, you're basically increasing that gap in terms of required energy production, which then, um, exacerbates the injury. Any evidence for cooling, Tommy? So for example, I mean, obviously, as you know from your work, um, when you're doing uh, certain types of heart surgery, you can actually cool the patient to 19 degrees Celsius. At least back when I yeah. was training, that was the sweet spot. I don't know if what the temperature is today. But if you were um, basically doing anything where you had to cross clamp the aorta uh, and prevent mm. cerebral perfusion, you would, you know, uh, you would you would cool the patient literally have ice around their head. The anesthesiologist would cool the patient, um, yeah. and obviously that was very protective. So, is there any evidence mm -hmm. that someone sustaining a concussion should go beyond just getting out of the sun and taking Tylenol, but perhaps be laying down and be you know bathed or at least have their head covered in ice? So the the short answer is no. There's no evidence for that, um, and there's a long story to to answer that question. So, in animal models. And again, this is something that I've, I've published extensively on. Hypothermia is magic for acute brain injuries, right? If you can decrease core temperature by three to four degrees Celsius for, you know, three, you know, 24 hours to 72 hours after the injury, you, know, you get a significant reduction in, in brain injury. In one specific scenario, and that's acute, um, acute uh, brain injury in babies that have some kind of issue around birth, therapeutic hypothermia, so cooling to 33.5 degrees Celsius core temperature for three days is the standard of care. It was brought into the resuscitation guidelines and, in and 2010. They, they do that just externally. They're not using ECMO or anything like yes. that. Okay. No. Uh, so if uh, the, so some of those kids can go on ECMO, but that's because of respiratory failure. And, and so you can cool on pump, but no, this is a, just an external cooling with a, with a, with a, with a, with a blanket. In models of TBI, it is similarly neuroprotective in animals. Um, huge bodies of work say that if you if you create a, a traumatic brain injury in an animal model and then cool that animal down, they get decreased injury. Dozens of trials, billions of dollars have been spent trying to replicate this in humans, and it has not worked. Um, and you know, people thought the temperature wasn't right, the duration wasn't right. You know, obviously in traumatic brain injury, you have a very heterogeneous population. Maybe the population wasn't right. Um, but in reality, there's no evidence that hypothermia works uh, for concussions or any kind of traumatic brain injury. Uh, but what, what does seem to work is maintaining normothermia. So basically co uh, a core temperature at or below 36.5 degrees Celsius, uh, ideally. There are some people out there who will sell cool caps uh, and things. And, and there are, you know, I think I once spoke on, on a podcast and, and said what I just said. And somebody emailed me and was like, here's my unblinded open study of my cool cap in some hockey players that shows that it improves recovery from concussion. Um, there is no high quality evidence that these things work. Um, partic so particularly because externally cooling the brain, you're probably not going to get the brain cold enough to do it. You know, what you need to do is you would need to cool the blood Carides. going up into the yeah. brain. So yeah. Um, but in reality, I don't think there's much evidence there. So focusing on Preventing fever or managing fever, I think, is very beneficial. But then, active cooling below that doesn't seem to, to add anything. And and these studies, 
they demonstrated they were they were actually cooling the neck. They were demonstrating that they were achieving a significant reduction in brain temperature. So not um, so these external devices like cooling the neck um, in individuals con with concussion that hasn't been shown to be beneficial when when they've trialed hypothermia. Um, oh, I just mean, but, but did they demonstrate? Did they actually demonstrate efficacy of cooling? Not that it reduced no. con concussion, but did they show that they can cool the brain? No. So this is another issue: is that um, particularly with milder external forms of cooling, how do you know the brain is actually exactly. being cooled? And so yeah. sometimes, so in, in these studies, you may see, like particularly if they're doing external cooling on the scalp, they'll uh, do. Uh, they'll measure scalp temperature and say, well, the scalp is colder, therefore the brain is colder. That's not necessarily yeah, the case. Right. So so no, uh, there, there isn't documented evidence that these things can directly significantly cool brain temperature. Yeah. So so there's two problems, right? One is we don't know if we're even cooling the brain in these studies. And of course, therefore, we don't know if cooling the brain would, would uh, minimize or mitigate this risk. It could be the complexity of the human model and given mm. our surface area relative to, you know, tiny, you know, infants have a, a surface area uh, amount that allows for easy external cooling. In fact, that's one yeah. of the challenges of taking care of pediatric patients is they're very susceptible to insensible losses in the way that adults are not. So you hear you're mm. using it to your advantage. So that's very interesting. I if it doesn't work, in other words, if we could be sure that those studies are indeed cooling the brain but it is not having an impact. What is your explanation for the discordance between that and the pediatric and animal literature? So there, there are two potential things that, that, that could conceivably remain as our answer questions. So one is that the majority of cooling studies, although this has been overcome in a lot of them, but the majority of cooling studies are probably not cooling soon enough. So there's actually a very narrow window um, again, based on animal studies that says in an acute brain injury, you basically need to start cooling therapy within six hours, but probably ideally within three hours of the injury. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're running a clinical trial, That's this person impossible. has to be yeah. found, right? It's the same as doing thrombolysis in stroke, like trying to get it as soon as possible. It's very difficult. So if you could immediately cool, maybe, maybe that's part uh, of the issue. The other issue um, which uh, is, is potentially a little bit controversial, but I think is increasingly being appreciated in the neonatal literature, is that when they did the original cooling trials, the control group were kept at 37 degrees Celsius and had a lot of fever. So it could be... Oh, you mean the controls were managed with Tylenol and thermoregulation to keep them at 37? No, so so originally they, they would, um, in those original cooling trials in neonates, they, the control group was hot. So if you yeah. look at a baby's normal temperature after they're born, they don't immediately go to 30, 37 degrees Celsius. They may never get there. Mm. You know, they'll slowly warm up over a day or so. But though in those trials, the control group were immediately warmed up to 37, mm. and they also pre uh, frequently had fever, and they weren't managing those fevers because they were... Because that was in the era where you were worried about the kids getting cold. Yeah, so in other words, you may hot. have you may have made the controls worse off and artificially created Ex a gap. Exactly. So in more modern cooling trials, they do targeted temperature management in the control group. So the control group is kept at thirty six point five um, uh, degrees Celsius core temperature, and then compared to that, the cooling group doesn't seem to have a benefit. So some of the effect in neonates may be due to uh, a worsening of outcome in the control group rather than benefit in the intervention group. Very interesting. Um, okay, another topic I wanna ask you about is uh, hyperbaric oxygen. And presumably this will be in the chronic phase, not, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. maybe someone's yeah, okay. looking at this in the acute phase, but but it, so so address it as you see fit. but. Clearly, I see a lot of people talking about hyperbaric oxygen. I get asked about this all the time from patients. Uh, I'm quite ambivalent about this. So I'm, I generally think the hyperbaric oxygen industry is a racket. Um, mm. I think there are definitely indications for it. There are clearly places like wound healing where I think it matters. 
you know, I, I probably think the opportunity cost notwithstanding, there might be, it might be reasonable to consider hyperbaric oxygen for, for, for brain injury. Um, but I haven't really found any compelling data. So it's possible I just haven't been looking hard enough and, and obviously you're closer to it. So what, what's your state of the understanding of the, the role of that? I think the, the phase is critically important. Um, firstly, because in the acute phase of injury, there, are, there is evidence that hyperbaric oxygen can be detrimental. Um, there are, I've, I know of some studies where they've tried to uh, get hyperbaric oxygen in as early as possible after traumatic brain injury, and they've had an increase in negative uh, side effects. I don't think those studies are published yet, but I've certainly heard of that work um, going on. So presumably just creates more, react more reactive oxygen species in a, in a hyperinflammatory exactly. environment. Exactly. That, that's exactly it. And again, so if you have, you have impaired function and then you try and shove a bunch of extra oxygen in there, you're, you're essentially just driving oxidative stress. Um, and the, I, know, I, I know of some people who have actually, you know, there have been significant uh, injuries in like professional sports and they've immediately got, gotten that person in the chamber. That is not something that I would recommend and I don't think there's evidence to support it. Longer term, so in the chronic phase, I think there's, there's a possibility of benefit. And again, you know, there are some data out there to suggest that those after concussion or traumatic brain injury, they may see um, improvement after exposure to, to multiple rounds of hyperbaric oxygen. However, there are a couple of things that just, you know, should drive some equipoise currently. One is that most of these trials are single arm, uh, you know, uncontrolled studies. And it's actually quite hard to create, to create a control group in hyperbaric oxygen um, studies because you, you can tell when the chamber is being pressurized. And so to try and create a scenario where you have a sham effect that may mm. create the same placebo is quite tricky. Um, the second is that, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, I, I read a, a study where they're like, you know, these people, they all improved, you know, we did six months of hyperbaric oxygen, they got it twice a week. And in my mind, you're just invoking Voltaire, um, where they said, where, who said that medicine is the art of entertaining the patient while nature cures the disease, right? That brain was going to get better anyway. Having said that, I think there, there are some, there are some you know, sort of early data that suggests that, you know, improved uh, cognitive function, you know, maybe you're restore, uh, restoring uh, m uh, metabolic uh, function within the brain, mitochondrial function with um, some periods of hyperbaric oxygen. It probably takes several, um, uh, uh, several rounds. So like, you know, like a couple of months, at least 30 plus exposures seems to be required. And again, this is sort of like, Anecdotal, I've seen people's pilot data. This is not large randomized controlled trials or anything like that. Uh, but there, there, I think there is potential benefit. And, you know, part of it. And by the way, how long, uh, maybe, how long after? You're saying anytime after 72 hours or you'd wait even longer potentially? I'd probably wait a couple of weeks would be my guess until we're sort of like the, the full initial phase of the injury has, has, has resolved. Um, and, 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 you, and you're basically saying two 60 minute sessions weekly. And and they're doing this to what depth, or what's the whatever metric of think, metric pressure? I think generally they do two 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 atmospheres. I think I think is is, is generally what's, so, so what's done. Two atmospheres, an hour at a time, twice a week, and potentially Something several like, months. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's yeah. certainly long enough for Voltaire to to take over. Um, so it's very <laughs> it's very difficult to know. What about supplements such as creatine monohydrate and our good friends the omega? three, the marine omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA. Do they play any role here in, in supplementation if a person is not using them, i.e. adding them, or is there any benefit for using uh, higher doses than people might, might use? We typically you know, talk about using five grams of creatine monohydrate daily. Mm. Talked about that in the past on the podcast, lots of benefits associated with creatine monohydrate use, both cognitively and physically. Um, and we talked about, you know, two, two or three, maybe even up to four grams of EPA DHA having, um, benefit, uh, what, what's the, what's the evidence for their efficacy here? And, and how do you think about dosing them? So I think the doses, uh, are very similar, but I, I do think, uh, there's a strong case for, for benefit. Um, there's, 
you know, no good study that gives every, you know, a bunch of people creatine before they get uh, traumatic brain injuries. That's one of the problems with uh, TBIs. It's difficult to predict. Therefore, it's hard to hard to do, you know, good quality prophylactic studies. But in animal models, you can see that if you supplement with creatine for several days, um, you know, the optimal period maybe five to seven days uh, with a with a loading type dose, so the equivalent of you know 0.2 grams per kilo, something like that, which would you know, for 20 grams per per, per uh, 20 grams per day for a week, the equivalent in in both rats and mice before a traumatic brain injury is, is significantly neuroprotective. That kind of dose and time periods, so something like 20 grams a day for a week, has been shown to significantly increase brain creatine levels by doing something like uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. You can point an MRI scanner at the brain and you can see the levels of creatine in it. At the same time, uh, there have been some studies in, in high school football athletes that have looked at that same measure over a, a football season and seen that related to the number of impacts that the, the kid gets, there's a decrease in brain creatine in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the primary motor cortex. So suggesting that creatine is being used up um, by Im impact and you know, it provides this sort of short-term pH and, and energy uh, buffer that, that may be protective when, when, there's a, when there's an impact. And those kids are taking 20 grams a day throughout the season or five grams a day? No, these are, these are two separate lines of evidence. Oh, so, so one so is that's that, just yes, looking at yeah. innate or endogenous yeah, creatine. That's, yep. okay, yeah, got it. so they're not supplementing. Yep. It's just looking at endogenous levels of creatine that decrease throughout the season and that's related to impacts. So we know that with standard dosing of creatine, we can increase a brain creatine levels. And we also know that uh, with impacts, uh, brain creatine seems to decrease. And one of the... Um, one of the thought processes behind something called second impact syndrome, which is that you have a concussion, you recover okay, you seem to be doing okay, that first, con that first concussion or that first impact doesn't have a big effect, but the, s the next one has a much bigger, has an outsized effect. Yeah, we saw an and aw one awful of the example of this in the NFL this year with the Dolphins quarterback, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and one of the things that may be happening there, some people think that at least part of that is you've depleted creatine brain depletion. creatine with that first impact and then there's a greater effect of the second impact. And there's probably maybe multiple things that happen because brain choline also seems to decrease in a similar, in a similar manner. Um, then, so I, so I think there's, there's, a, there's a case to be made for prophylactic creatine in those who are at high risk. If you can you know, estimate when you're gonna be at highest risk, I may do a loading period, 20 grams for a week. So you, know, you can increase brain creatine. But then after impact, you know, there are several studies that and I think this is what you've talked about previously, where um, uh, creatine may improve some of the problems that happen after a concussion. So and we know that creatine can offset some of the, um, the cognitive deficits caused by sleep deprivation, and, and sleep can be an issue with those with concussion. Um, in multiple studies, creatine supplementation improves cognitive function. Uh, that seems, you know, the greatest effect seems to be in those who are oldest, uh, but if you have some deficit in cognitive function, uh, which may be related to creatine if it's through a concussion, then uh, supplementation may be beneficial. Um, and finally, there's some evidence that it may uh, help with mood. Um, creatine has been tested in two randomized controlled trials where they've added it on top of SSRIs in those who responded poorly. Or, or incompletely to the SSRIs and saw improvements um, in, in depression symptoms. So I think there's multiple reasons why if you're a high risk of a TBI or you've had a TBI, it's worth thinking about creatine supplementation. And, and presumably if you have long enough time, just being on five grams daily will get you will will get you what the 20 gram loading dose do. So because again, the, to your point, if you, can, if you can't predict when you're gonna have a TBI, <laughs> you can't always be taking 20 and waiting. If you just took five yeah. every day, you'd produce similar levels of, uh, uh, of uh, within the brain. Um, and tell me about your thoughts on, on EPA or, or DHA mm. specifically around this. For related to concussion, I think DHA um, is probably the, the, the more important one. Um, and it, it's very similar actually to some of the processes that we thought about with cognitive decline, you know, around neuronal structure and normal uh, neuronal function. There was uh, one nice study where they looked at supplementing with different levels of DHA again throughout a high school uh, uh, football season. And what they saw, they supplemented with either two, four or six grams of DHA. And actually all of those groups 
um, and no, with no greater benefit with a higher dose, um, saw a decrease in play-related circulating neurofilament light, which is a, a marker of neuronal injury that you can pick up um, you know, when, when you get you know, when you get, when you get when you get a concussion. So across the season, neurofilament light tended to increase in the athletes, but that was mitigated in the DHA supplementation groups. Is that a biomarker you see in the blood, or is that something you see on an, on? Can you tag for it on an MRI? No, it's a biomarker you see in the blood. Interesting. Um, are there any other supplements that you think should be a part of the toolkit for? basically anybody. I mean, here's the reality of it is I, we're all kind of at risk for TBI. I mean, you mm -hmm. get into a car accident, you have a TBI, you're walking down the sidewalk and someone bumps you while they're on their little electric scooter, you can get a TBI. So it's certainly the case that different occupations, different sports, different stages of life will have a higher versus lower risk. But um, it's hard for me to imagine that if there's a low risk way to mitigate it, we shouldn't all be doing it, given that none of us know when we're going to you know, get hit by an aberrant softball or get into a car accident or fall while we're skiing or whatever it is that we do. So, mm. so what would you put in the category of kind of no regret moves along with DHA and creatine, which already have so much benefit that we've discussed in other podcasts vis-a-vis -vis brain health. Uh, and in the case of creatine, not just brain health, but also, uh, you, you know, muscle performance, um, mm. and anything else that rises to the level of, you just, you got to think about it. Yeah, so assuming that other things are taken care of, so right, you know you're in good metabolic health because we know blood sugar regulation is going to be important, and um, you you know your homocysteine isn't 15, yep. right? Uh, I think that that that's going to be important. Then the the final thing that I would say goes in that list is is choline, as citicoline or CDP choline, um, and again, now you know, do you get enough to, of that just eating eggs or things that are rich in choline? Yeah, so if, if you if you eat a couple of eggs a day on average, um, you know some things with lecithin in, you know phosphatidylcholine, you're probably getting enough from the diet. Um, but post impact, I would probably take one to two grams per day. And there's there's some evidence that not the choline helps with very severe traumatic brain injuries, but in those you know in in survivors, there's some improvement in neuropsychological outcomes in those who supplement with choline. So that's another one. Those three things, I think, uh, are definitely worth considering. And tell me the format you, you, you would supplement the choline in? Uh, citicoline uh, slash CDP choline, which is the same thing. Okay. Uh, but alpha GPC, which is the other form of choline, is, is much less studied in, in, in that context. So I would take, take um, citicoline. Okay. And again, we're presumably we're going to the same brands that we're talking about, right? Whether it be Thorne or yeah. Gero or uh, Pure Encapsulations kind of go with a super high quality brand, even if you're going to pay a little bit more, it's uh, a relatively small price to pay uh, to consider the uh, the alternative. Um, Tommy, this is super interesting. Uh, amazingly, we have not really spent much time on F1. Um, <laughs> maybe, I'll, maybe I'll close with one F1 related question. Um, for the for the casual observer of F one, maybe someone who knows a little bit about it but not a lot, you, you've obviously you get to spend a lot of time on the inside of F one. What's mm -hmm. something that you think would surprise the um, the casual observer about the sport, and maybe something about the demands of the driver? What what do you, what do you think would would kind of <clears throat> endear people to pay closer attention to F one, which is of course my secret ambition with this podcast. So. I'm not sure if if this uh, qu qualifies as, as as your for your last request, but but the thing that surprised me the most is probably related to the first things you said. Um, you know, and and that is how much attention is paid to the health and performance of the driver relative to the health and performance of the car. Historically, in F1, the car was everything, right? Yes, I mean, and then basically you would just bring in a driver who was good and that was it. You'd let them get on with it. And because of the amount of travel, the amount of media commitments, so, I mean, they probably spend half their time with media commitments, right, rather than working on the car or working with the engineers or in the simulator or whatever, you know, so, so probably the, the amount of time they have to do things like that. But because of all of that, the, the capacity to do a bunch of things related to their health and performance is, is quite small, right? They just, they just don't have that availability of cognitive or time resources to do it. So 
this, you know, this, they'll spend a bunch of time with their with their coach or trainer on in the gym, aerobic work, all that stuff is important. But then things on top of that, it's very variable from driver to driver how much they focus on it, and it's also variable how much they're willing or interested in in focusing on that. So what was useful to me going into that world is, and I imagine you would be the same, right? You'd show up and be like, I have a list of a hundred things that are going to help. Um, here it is. Uh, and um, when you work with professional uh, or high level endurance athletes, right? Solo athletes, they're all, fo- it's, it's all their own performance. They're, and they're usually type A's. They will do it. They'll do all a hundred things, no questions asked. In that setting, you have to be really certain that the thing that you're asking that driver to do is going to be is going to be beneficial. So, you know, even if you don't have hundreds of randomized controlled trials, you have to be, you know, you, you're really working with that sort of this idea of positive asymmetry. So, like, very little risk, very high potential benefit, whatever, whatever it is, and you're also selecting that one thing, you know, instead of. The 99, the 99 other things on your list. So it really forces you to focus on what's going to be the most impactful thing that's actually likely to be able to make it into, you know, the the sort of the driver's processes, and you know, you know, have 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 a a strong feeling that that's the thing that you should really be focusing on. Yeah, the the the, the opportunity cost is so great that. Um, and there's so many other demands, as you said. I mean, understanding the balance of the car, understanding how they can, because I think what most people probably also don't understand that we take for granted as as sort of diehards is, you know, you've got 23 races in the year. Every race, the car has to be a little bit different. Yeah. Every circuit is different. So uh, a street circuit like Monaco has pretty much nothing in common with a big track circuit like Monza. And, you know, a circuit that has lots of high speed corners without many low speed corners is totally different than the reverse. And, Mm. you know, circuits with long straightaways where you want very low drag, very different from circuits that are short and fast. And each of those changes everything about the dynamics of the car, changes everything about how temperature gets into the tires, stays in the tires, degrades, track surface, all these things. So, you know, they, the minute they finish that race on Sunday, they've got two weeks, sometimes one week, to completely change the car, to optimize yeah. it for what they think it's going to do and behave the next <laughs> week, and the driver has to be ready to do that. And yeah, and then, you know, someone like you comes in and says, all right, like, we've only got this much time to get you physically ready. And of course, the jet lag demands are sort of insane, right? I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's it's really hard to fathom how much they are crisscrossing the globe. I'm sure. Um, actually, there's a, there's a great um, little video I saw on on Instagram that showed uh, like the flight path of the season, uh, and it di- it did it to the awesome like F1 theme song. It's just it's oh, it's, yeah. it's so perfectly done. Um, w- without naming any names, um, <clears throat> what what um, intervention or advice that you've given a driver are you most proud of in terms of the impact it's had on his performance so i think um something that that i really um in, enjoyed or i thought it was really impactful recently was um helping a driver who was focusing on time off the start line um and, and of course i mean in general i'm not directly interacting with the driver the driver has a coach and you know, a lot of the interactions is me and the coach and tinkering with things, the coach goes away, obviously has other people they work with and, and kind of implement things. But there's um, basically various different ways to get um, get the driver uh, ready to react. I think my AirPods, my, my AirPods have died. Oh. So getting the driver ready to react um, and have an optimal reaction speed off the line, but then you also want to balance that against the sort of how they might react later in the race. Because that's the, the, the arousal curve we, we talked about earlier. So there were various things that we tried in terms of um, uh, training reaction time. There were some supplements we tried out. So um, things around uh, caffeine, timing, and dose. Um, uh, uh, I think uh, tyrosine is an interesting one that, that may also be beneficial. I think we tinkered with that a little bit. 
Um, creatine was obviously something that, that, that came into play. Uh, there are other skills that I think translate um, uh, across that kind of thing, like uh, playing the drums. So you have to be relaxed, but you also have to be, you know, timing is, is critical. Uh, I don't think that one was ever impl implemented, but that was a, the, a thought process that, that, that we talked about. So, and, you know, there were a whole bunch of things that happened and a whole bunch of things that were changed and the outcome improved. I can't say that anything that I did made the difference, but at least, you know, we reached, we reached the end goal, which was, which was a, a nice process of sort of uh, scientifically tinkering with things to, 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 to get our end goal. Well, Tommy, thank you very much for uh, humoring my uh, my endless fascination with F1, and um, thank you more than that for 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 making time to to share with me and everybody listening um, all of these insights. Uh, this is a fascinating discussion. Uh, I, I seem that the the more I learn about the brain, the less I know, uh, which is a, a common refrain for 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 anybody, I guess, who's trying to get deeper and deeper into subject matter. So, um, anyway, thank you very much, Tommy, and I. Uh, I hope to see you this year at, at Coda. Yeah, likewise. Uh, thanks so much uh, for having me. I, I certainly feel the same uh, about the brain, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated with it. And I really appreciate uh, the time uh, to talk to you, and then obviously everybody uh, for listening as well. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks.